London, welcome. Andrew Carter, who is Chief Executive of Centre for Cities, welcome. And Mubin <coughs> Pak, who is the Director of Policy and Grants at the Trust for London. So, we are going to start off um, with just looking at a bit of an overview of the Economic Development Strategy. <coughs> Deputy Mayor, can I ask you to set out the Mayor's overall approach to the Economic Development Strategy? Thank you very much and good morning and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, London's dynamic economy creates a huge range of uh, opportunities. The chance to find well-paid work, to progress in a rewarding career and to enjoy all that the city has to offer. It attracts the best and the brightest from all over the world. But for many Londoners, uh, the wealth and prosperity on their doorsteps uh, can seem remote and inaccessible. The mayor is determined to create a fairer, more inclusive economy. Uh, he wants all Londoners to be able to participate in and benefit from the city's economic success. As London's economy grows, its prosperity should be reflected in higher living standards. Creating a fairer, more inclusive economy also means making the city more affordable. If people are to see continued improvements in their living standards, London needs a strong and growing economy. The mayor wants London to be world's greatest city for business, a capital for trade and investment, and for that to happen, London must remain open for entrepreneurs uh, that want to start and grow their businesses here. Um, to be competitive on the world stage, businesses need to be even more productive and innovative. To raise productivity, firms must be able to invest in new technologies, products and processes. This, this requires a very competitive uh, business environment which provides stability and confidence to businesses. Businesses must be able to access financial capital and first-class infrastructure, including digital connectivity. And uh, they uh, need to be able to invest in uh, the skills of their workforce through high-quality education and training. The mayor wants London to continue to offer the most competitive business environment in the world. At the same time, London must remain open to all uh, most talented workers from across the globe, including Europe. All the forecasts point to further major growth in population and employment in London in the decades ahead. However, the mayor recognizes that the, uh, the growth cannot be pursued at all costs. Uh, that is why the mayor wants to see good growth in London. This is the growth that is well planned and sustainable. Uh, the mayor wants London's growth to benefit all of the UK, including the devolved nations. He supports both the Northern Powerhouse and the Midlands Engine uh, initiatives because more trade and investment between regions benefit everyone. <laughs> However, London's unique contribution to the national economy needs to be recognised. London accounts for more than a fifth of UK's economic output and one of its uh, one, of, one in three of its service exports on these and many other measures London is unquestionably the engine for national economy keeping that engine running isn't just good for Londoners it benefits the whole nation uh, it relies on a symbiotic relationship with other regions when London grows so does the rest of the country if resources such as funding of vital infrastructure uh, where to be diverted from capital investors. From the capital investors, we'll look at other global cities. So the mayor is very keen to strengthen collaboration uh, with other UK cities to support national economic growth. Thank you. That's a, um, a, a whistle stop tour of a, a, of a big, um, big fact document. Um, can I just ask you further, how do you think he seeks to act? shape that growth and development that you talk about of in within the London economy so how how is he going to be <coughs> shaping um, that growth and development uh, so it has to be worked very collaboratively obviously the economic development strategy is a very high level document uh, for a long longer term uh, sort of plan um, but one of the key things I mean it's affected the, the, the times are changing and the way economy is changing, um, 
due to a lot of other factors like technology, uh, the way sort of workforces uh, needs to be changed and adopted as well. And that is why skills is uh, at the heart of uh, a lot of this. But it needs to be an economy that works for uh, all Londoners and uh, nobody should be <coughs> left behind. Um, and making sure we've got the right kind of growth factors, right kind of infrastructure, right kind of skills, um, and opportunities that are accessible to all. Perhaps I can bring in um, some of the others on this, on the, on the, the kind of overview of, of the mayor's um, strategy, and I'll start with Andrew. Um, what do you think the mayor and regional government can realistically achieve through strategies such as the economic development strategy? <coughs> Are there any examples that you can think of of other cities around um, the UK or foreign cities with strategies that might have something that London can learn? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, in a sense, what the Deputy Mayor was uh, telling us was London's success uh, and future prosperity are driven by things that are beyond the control of the Mayor in many respects. So we think about Eurozone growth and global growth. Both of those will be major factors in whether London is successful <coughs> in the future or not. As of yet, the Mayor doesn't have control over Eurozone matters or indeed you know, global growth matters and obviously immigration and openness are issues that are beyond his control although they are national government uh, issues that he can uh, argue for more control over. When we look at what matters to uh, London's economy, things that are within his orbit, within his remit, there are things around housing I think that we need to think carefully about. Uh, the extent to which uh, housing is given prominence that it deserves, particularly if we're worried about cost of living issues, which we most definitely are at the lower end of the uh, labour market and at the, uh, the wage spectrum. Uh, transport, obviously a big uh, issue, the degree to which people are able to access and use the transport system uh, physically as well as uh, through the price mechanism, and then skills. So we've got some, some stuff that is outside of London's control and stuff that is very much within the mayoral control. When we look at other places, it, it, there are always examples in a sense who would disagree with what's in the EDS. Right? No one would disagree with what's in the EDS, that's part of the issue. The, the issue in a sense is what we're going to choose to do and there will be trade-offs <coughs> associated with that. So if you look at uh, programmes in Amsterdam, I think there's some interesting work around how they deal with land use competition, how they deal with skills at the lower end. I think Stockholm has got something interesting to say, Mariana may know more than me on this, around innovation and particularly public assets uh, in the driving of, of, uh, of uh, innovation and creating new neighbourhoods. Copenhagen, another good example uh, of that. Berlin, I think, is an interesting example of a, of a city that's emerging, since long forgotten, but emerging now dealing with housing pressures and cost of living pressures and having a more interventionist role uh, in the housing market than we've currently traditionally had uh, in the UK. So there are examples in, you know, in different places where we can, uh, we can exert and think about uh, how we might borrow some of their ideas or at least learn from what they're doing. But ultimately, I think, if you look at the EDS, it'll be the questions around the choices that we make, the priorities that we choose, rather than the scope and breadth of the EDS. Thank you. Would anyone else, Mariana, would you like to come in on the mm -hmm. question that Andrew sure. was just addressing? So first, I mean, what I found very um, exciting is that it's a strategy that very explicitly talks about three huge challenges together, which is to create a city that is more innovative, <coughs> and more entrepreneurial, more inclusive, and more sustainable. It wasn't, you know, should we do sustainability or should we do innovation? The three kind of are constantly um, in the front line there. What I think it lacks, and that's not a problem, I think we still have time to improve it, is what the links are between these three goals. And here I would sort of a bit differ from Andrew, which is I, I think that the details matter as much <coughs> as the vision. And if you don't get the vision right, if it doesn't sound very strategic and how those three ambitions are linked up, it's actually not going to work. And so what I mean by that is it sometimes feels as though it, it has the risk of becoming a box ticking exercise. So we have some you know, different plans for entrepreneurship, for innovation, some green roofs. So you know, very interesting and well-meaning uh, targets for each of those three ambitions. But what's the link? 
And I think the link is just, and I think this would be great in a redraft of this to put it sort of in the front page, which is that economic growth has not just a rate, but a direction. And London is going to be about green growth. So you don't just do the green stuff, again, green roofs or whatever green, green you know, uh, things are in the plan, which I think are actually very good, and then have your economic growth uh, 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 lists. You do them together. And we have a lot of examples of how this has worked in the past. So when growth was driven by, let's just call it the internet slash sort of digital economy, it wasn't that people sort of made a list of why the internet and the internet economy might be useful and then have sort of a separate innovation agenda. They were deep. <coughs> I think we have to achieve the same ambition with green. And we have to, I think, also address the lack of investment currently, private business investment, not just in London, but, and I'm talking about real investment, so not financial investment, in structures, uh, innovative structures, uh, capital investment, uh, machinery, research and development by the private sector. Um, and also in the UK, we have lower than average private business investment in terms of OECD uh, figures. And so how do you actually get business in London to become excited about a green growth strategy that really requires leadership? And business does invest when it sees an opportunity. You know, often businesses might talk about regulation and taxation, but if you talk to leading business people around the world, they will say that when they see an opportunity, they invest. So using the green and you know, sustainability strategy to really focus on how to get business excited about investing in a green growth agenda in London is critical. In innovation, we have to remember, is full of feedback effects and early mover advantages. So those businesses that get in early and those cities that get in early in a green growth agenda, because we are still relatively early if you look at the long scheme of how technological revolutions happen, we're sort of at the beginning of a green revolution, those cities I think really are going to lead. And if you look at what's happened in Denmark, more as a nation, to be honest, than just the cities, Denmark, by having a vision of how to do green at the center of its economic growth strategy, has become the number one provider of high-tech services to China's green economy. And China's spending 1.7 trillion, that's 12 zeros, <laughs> on green. And so this whole issue of how to also transform the services that we have in London, which is very much focused in many ways on different types of services, to transform the services to really be fueling a green growth agenda, I think is critical. Because if you look at the Bank of England data on financial intermediation and financial services in the UK, and as we know, they're mainly concentrated in London, finance has been financing finance, <laughs> right? So different types of finance have been fueling different <coughs> types of finance. And so you know, London could become sort of a, a leading city in the world to also transform this incredibly innovative set of different types of services in this green direction. And presumably you're, uh, are, are you, because I mean the, the, one of the key things we've been hearing has been about good growth and making sure that the um, economic development strategy is serving all Londoners, not just those who are um, doing well financially. Yes. So are you saying that that green growth um, agenda will address that fa those fairness issues as well? So I think maybe I should have said this as, as well sort of in, in the beginning, which is that inclusive growth, when it's divorced from innovation-led growth, becomes potentially, um, I don't want to say a boring <coughs> narrative, but it, 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 it reinforces a myth that somehow you have these wealth creators in the private sector, and then the state is there just to redistribute the wealth that's created privately to the citizenry. I think to actually have a proper green growth strategy, all citizens should be involved, and they should be, feel part of a collective wealth creation process. And they have been in the past, right? I mean, if you look at how important the green movement has actually been in cities worldwide and nations worldwide and actually creating the legitimacy for even talking about green, that's very important. And that means that you know, citizens have been, how do you say, uh, or can be even uh, more forcefully part of this whole issue of a directional push. Um, instead, when we allow, if you want, the green growth strategy to be just seen as an issue around renewable energy and different types of energy patches, then it also creates a very problematic discourse and language for a city, but also a nation, to feel that you know, this is actually about a collective agenda. Having said that, all these issues around ownership, I mean, one of the big problems I think we face in London, but again, also in the UK, is that we no longer have real, if you want, uh, 
public ownership and public directed sort of policies, right? So we have all these intermediary actors that often actually are quite fuzzy. We often can't even name who they are, both in the life sciences and in housing, who are getting public money. We know this, of course, just this week from the Carillion saga, getting public money to then do things without a, a vision and a public value, if you want, metric. And so I think one of the key points of the inclusive growth agenda should be to rethink what the metrics are in terms of public value and inclusive growth that go beyond just a redistribution issue. That's great. We're going to be coming on to um, mm -hmm. measuring um, a bit later later on, but thank you. Thank you very much. Can I also bring in um, Mubin here, just for <coughs> me, the overall <coughs> picture of the, of the uh, strategy? Well, I thought the tone was great. It's very little to disagree with in terms of uh, strategy. Um, and as a sort of high-level document, it works really well. I mean, in the forward, the mayor talks about poverty and inequality, which is what the Trust for London was set up to uh, try and tackle. So we're very happy with that. I think when you start going down to what's actually going to be delivered, that's where it, is, it becomes more problematic. And maybe there's going to be further documents and there's lots of references to other documents within uh, the strategy. But times pressing <coughs> on, what we would like to see is probably more urgent action on some of these issues. So. Um, just taking, for example, the Good Work Standard, it's something we have been talking about, the Mayor's mm -hmm. uh, had in his manifesto. And so we've not really, it's not really developed much more in the strategy from where the consultation happened uh, last year. So, and it may be that more documents are coming out, but what I'd like to see is a much clearer time scale of what's going to happen with some of these uh, pledges and promises and a sense of what they're trying to achieve as well. I mean, you could have a good work standard, for example, um, which signs up a number of employers, but actually it doesn't make much difference. Um, you know, it's going to sign up those who are already very well committed to good employer practice. So what I'm interested in is kind of scale and ambition. What kind of percentage of workforce is this going to try and cover? Um, and uh, what will we hope to see by the end of a mayoral term, the first mayoral term? Who knows, Sadiq Khan may be going for a, a one after that as well. But, you know, that's the bit which I find um, a bit problematic. There's another thing I also think is a little bit difficult, which is uh, the mayor's emphasis on inequality. So he says it's a, a, a hugely burning issue. Uh, inequality, the gulf between uh, 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 the very wealthy and the very poor uh, here in London. I think lo lots of us would be agreed on that. But the economic development strategy doesn't really then address how to reduce that gap. What it seems to say is you need to try and push up the bottom, and it, it, there's a number of measures in there about how you do that, so making London a living wage city, Etc. But it's nothing about what you do to address the top. So, uh, if a mere saying it is problematic, and that has impacts on health outcomes and uh, uh, economic growth of the city, and there's references to that in the, in the strategy, then surely there should be some policies which are addressing how to close that gap too. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a clarification question? <coughs> provides a point of clarification. So. Um, could you clarify what you mean by um, how the economic development strategy can reduce inequality by not just addressing issues at the bottom, but critically at the top? Um, and just secondly, to respond to your point on the good work standard, um, I can certainly get the timescales to you, but I know that the Mayor's Office is still currently considering the consultation responses and is holding a session, I think, with the Assembly in a couple of weeks, um, so I'll be able to get the final publication date to you. Sure. So uh, there are policies about, um, say, the living wage and there's a good work standard and how that can improve conditions at the bottom. What there's less of, or that I couldn't actually see, was, say, some of the policies <coughs> which come out from the high pay centre or the quality trust, which is, for example, around pay ratios, more transparency. Right. I don't think those in themselves actually uh, necessarily reduce uh, the gap. But what it does do is sets the tone 
and it starts creating a conversation, a bit like we saw around the gender pay gap. Now that we've got that transparency out there, actually we might see a movement in the right direction. And that's what we'd like to see the mayor championing uh, within London. Uh, it's great to hear what's happening on the Good Works stand, and what I'd like to see is that being made more public as to what the next steps are. <coughs> There's lots of organisations which we fund and lots of other funders are funding working in this area, and we'd really like to work with the Mayor on really pushing that agenda, but we do need the leadership coming from the Mayor as well to, kind of, to pull all of that together. Thank you very much. If, if you'll permit me, yes. Okay. Uh, one clarification on that. I, I believe, and I think Catherine in part referenced this, we are actually holding a round table yeah. event on the 23rd, which you are, I believe, invited to and attending, to, yeah. or, or a colleague. Yeah. So we, we are indeed working with organisations such, for, such as Trust for London on uh, further developing those plans around the good work standard. Interesting to hear. I mean, the, you know, that the thing about pay ratios mm -hmm. is um, is a huge, huge issue. So it'd be very good to hear more from the mayor's office on that in due course. I gather, Fiona, you had your <coughs> you were to come in. Um, I did. It was on a clarification between. Um, I, th I think you your question um, to Marina almost. almost um, sorry, Mariana, almost. Um, <laughs> I, ca I can't quite see it from here. Um, almost, almost covered it, which was um, my interpretation of good growth would include um, uh, both green growth and cover inclusivity. So I just wondered why you felt it was necessary to sort of differentiate between the two, because otherwise you, you could potentially get an imbalance between the inclusive approach to developing the economy and the very necessary, and I agree that London can sort of lead on that in, in the green growth. So I just... Um, wondered yeah. whether you couldn't incorporate both within the term good growth or whether that's a sort of just that I'm, I'm making that assumption or whether hmm. I think the word good um, is just doesn't say enough so I think that's why I said in the beginning that I think it's fantastic that, it's, that the strategy is very much about innovation sustainability and inclusion and the challenge is finding a way to actually do them together so that they're part of the same strategy, yeah. that this is the kind of growth we want. Again, economic growth has a direction, and those three, you know, innovation, sustainability, inclusion, are the type of growth we want. And the issues I found was that there wasn't always a clear link mm -hmm. on how we were thinking, and I just gave the example of green and innovation, but, okay. in some, but it's equally true, even more true in some ways with inclusion. And the reason I mentioned about the whole collective wealth creation part is that so many of the tax policies, if we think about things like capital gains tax, which I actually think is too low, you know, in a city like London where so much of the, of the, of the wealth actually is created through capital gains, we have to be careful about those kinds of tax policies which are actually rewarding short-termism, which is, I think, a, a general problem in the UK. But if you look at how some of these <coughs> policies have emerged, it's actually been through stories through discourses, through narratives of where wealth creation comes from. And key to an inclusive growth agenda is to really debunk that. It, you know, growth, wealth creation comes from a collective effort. Mm -hmm. And that's just as important as a redistribution, progressive redistribution strategy. Personally, I think the progressive agenda has often focused too much, as important as it is, on redistribution and not enough on the issue of where does wealth actually come from. And we will not get green innovation-led growth without a real sort of collective London effort, and I think this is where we could become, as a city, really cutting edge. You know, mm. the place where financial services, where business investment, where citizen engagement really shift growth in a sustainable way, and hence how do we then redistribute that growth in a way that, that is just as collective as the effort. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to move on to um, Andrew Dismore, who is going to be looking sort of broadly at the context of the London economy. Um, thank you. What do you see the weaknesses in the economy are now and what the challenges are going to be? What are the so weaknesses of the economy? <coughs> and obviously there are, I mean, there, there are quite a few sort of challenges. Of course, the one big sort of staring in our face is uh, Brexit, yeah, uh, which that. poses a number of challenges. I mean, it's not just one sort of big challenge. Um, but London is one of the sort of most successful uh, city economies uh, in the world. But many Londoners actually don't share that success. Um, and the wages have uh, struggled to uh, keep pace with the rising cost of uh, living. So it's quite important to address that inequality and fairness so that everybody sort of feels part of this growth and has got a, 
share in in <coughs> so that is uh, i would say um, sort of one of the sort of challenges uh, that we need to uh, tackle how to get the sort of wages up um, and have more uh, stable employment and especially with the technological changes uh, the way employment uh, scene is also is changing uh, quite a lot so this rise in gig economy for instance um so it's quite important to uh, address uh, some of the challenges posed by all these technological uh, changes uh, with brexit comes a challenge around talent uh, because if i if you look at different sectors whether it's hospitality whether it's technology um, pretty much all sectors have got a lot of people from all over the world almost 40% of london's population was actually born outside of the uh, uk um so you know we are a city that thrives because of its openness to talent and that is uh, at risk with uh, brexit um um but also uh, the productivity um which whilst london has got one of the higher product uh, uh, more productivity than some of the other cities but if you sort of compare on a sort of global scale there's so much more that can be done i think we are still sort of uh, not not as reaching our potential in productivity and to increase productivity you need innovation uh, investment in technology um and also upskilling the workforce very very important and that's why uh, you know that's one of the things uh, that we are trying to uh, tackle through the eds um and in fact there's a separate sort of skill strategy which is non statutory uh, but it's quite important i think uh, skills uh, going forward but making sure all of this growth with all these factors whatever happens is sustainable so it's not just short term f- focusing on uh, certain sectors which are sort of higher growth sectors you know, are, especially i think with technology it's impacting all lot of different sectors but a uh, lot of uh, focus on uh, some, of, some of these things um but also with the sort of urbanization the population is increasing uh, in london and there are sort of demographic and social changes we are more diverse than ever before as a city which is which is a great thing but at the same time uh it it comes with its own with its own uh, sort of challenges uh, which we got to uh, deal with uh, making sure the the sort of aging population uh, is another one so there is a whole host of challenges in we're trying to address through uh, ads okay um the cambridge economic econometrics report on brexit was quite interesting obviously it gave a range of of uh, possibilities from hard brexit nothing doing to a much softer brexit um do you think that the economic development strategy fully reflects the risks and risks of brexit uh, of course it's a high level document uh, it's mm-hmm. for the sort of longer term um so you know we've, we've we've tried to be sort of more flexible in our approach um but there's a lot of other work being done um but but the document eds in itself is not just a document around brexit of course uh, i mean it's a much higher level and a much longer term uh, documents it talks about the challenges uh, that uh, brexit will will throw but also the wider challenges over next uh, you know couple of years if i may it, it it's worth clarifying that we obviously with drafting the economic development strategy we've been aware throughout that um because we are uncertain on what the ultimate brexit arrangements will bring we can't be 100% certain about the prevailing economic conditions that will exist in a few years time and specifically some of the direct impacts on issues like talent which rajesh mentioned before access to talent that is um and on the circumstances that uh london businesses both in goods uh, goods and service exporters will face um what that means is we've had to adopt a flexible approach um certainly uh we're open to the notion that this economic development strategy may have to be revised once we do know more about the future conditions so we you know th- that remains uh, open this is a strategy that takes us up to 2041 so as such we would be uh, uh it would be wrong to suggest that this is absolutely set in stone beyond brexit Yeah, Brexit could take us way beyond 2041. Mm. Um so I mean that was going to be one of the questions going to put. So the, the secret <laughs> of the development strategy came out before the Cambridge report. Mm. I think in sequence. So obviously the second one couldn't have influenced the first one. Um 
But as you look at, and this is in draft, are you planning to update this to reflect the findings of the, of the Cambridge report um, as you go along? Or are you going to wait until the final Brexit deal and then have another go? Like, like other inputs that will uh, come through the consultation process, including, of course, the conversation we're having today, certainly the findings from Cambridge will influence the final draft of the economic development strategy, which will be published in, uh, in, in the summer. Or, albeit, we still will not know at that point what the future holds in terms of Brexit. Hopefully we'll have a little more certainty by that point than we do now. Yeah, I mean, you, Rajesh has mentioned talent and migration issue, which is obviously very important. I think we're seeing signs already of people voting with their feet. Um, I mean, some people have told me that that's because they want to get back to their home country, so they're not at the back of the queue looking for jobs mm -hmm. um, at the, at when, uh, when Brexit happens. Um, another aspect of talent also, I mean, this is for universities I guess, is the huge contribution that overseas students make towards London's economy. And if the government sticks their rule of saying that students are included in the migration target of 99,999, that creates a significant issue for us. The Mayor's been clear that he uh, opposes uh, that particular government policy and has called um, quite recently for it to be reversed and uh, if rumours are to be believed there are signs that that may be the case in future. Uh, he's also called for example um, for the reinstatement of a post-study work route for international students again so we can keep in London uh, more of the talent that we actually uh, bring on in our city. So can I, can I just... Can I just mention Mariana just in... Yeah, I'll, I'll just bring Mariana okay, in a minute. Yeah, I, I just want to just push, push on Brexit a bit further. And Rajesh particularly focused on, on talent. I think that is one of the key issues for us. What other challenges from Brexit do you particularly think we need to worry about? I mean, of course, uh, <coughs> access to uh, single market uh, is, is quite important. Um, tariff free access the way it is, and that's why the sort of mayor's position on this has been very clearly that uh, having continued membership of the single market. Um, but in the, I mean, for the sort of purposes of the sort of strategy, I think it's um, talent is by and large. I think, you know, in my sort of previous life as as an entrepreneur, but also in last eighteen months. Uh, as deputy mayor, I've spoken to hundreds, <coughs> if not thousands, of businesses, um, and uh, uh, talent is the number one issue that sort of comes up uh, all the time. And the with the change in technology, the change is coming a lot quicker and faster than a lot of people think, and that's why skills, having the right kind of skills for the workforce, is very important as well. So I think uh, making sure that uh, our workforce is ready, not just for the jobs of today, but for the jobs of tomorrow, uh, I think <coughs> that will be one of the big challenges as well. So Mariana, what should you say? Well, I was just going to, because you, uh, I think it was the Deputy Mayor who mentioned um, <coughs> sectors, and I think there's a in, sort of an international debate right now happening, and um, I think Greg Clark, the Minister for Base, also recognises this, that talking about sectors risks kind of creating a static approach to investment and innovation where if you look at some of the kind of key drivers of innovation-led growth, it's often been where organizations, which include city organizations, focus on problems, oh, what I call missions, that then require lots of different sectors to work together in new ways in order to solve. And I was just wondering if you could name some of the problems and missions that you've been thinking about for London as a city, <coughs> which would then require investment and innovation across, you know, transport, nutrition, uh, creative industries, finance, because I think it's really those concrete, you know, coming to the issue of concreteness in terms of what will actually change. We, you know, the more we think about cities as problem solving yeah. and using that as a way to drive innovation, the more real all this will become. And I just wanted to. Hear. I think you're absolutely uh, right on this, and you know, it's it's about taking the sort of right kind of approach. And I also agree with the point you made earlier on that it's not just about sort of few large companies sort of driving the uh, growth. It's about innovation at all levels. And innovation is so important uh, at all levels. And um, <coughs> that's why we're doing certain other things. Uh, for example, uh, we're doing a lot of work to support uh, SMEs through uh, our growth hub, through the uh, new fund of funds that we are uh, working on and so on. But in terms of um, <coughs> your point around sort of having a mission-led approach, mm -hmm. um, uh, the uh, mayor has announced um, Civic Innovation Challenge, uh, for instance. So it's about um, some of the challenges, of, uh, sort of 
how can you sort of use innovative approach to solve some of the challenges faced by the city mm -hmm. and that could be across a lot of different sectors it's not sector specific the only reason why we have to do more sex sector specific approach is of course because of brexit different sectors get affected in a different way uh, it affects certain sectors more than it does the other sectors uh, to a certain extent and that's why uh, and then the responses from uh, uh, so for those sectors have to be slightly different. And that's why from, we've had a little bit more sectoral approach in this, but actually it's more mission-led by and large. I totally agree with your point. But what's an example of a mission that I, the mayor is thinking about? Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> we've identified um, for the first pilot a, a approach of a mission-led approach, um, we've identified inequality, climate change, and an aging population. So those are challenges? As three mission. big challenges mm -hmm. that we will put out to London's entrepreneurial community, inc including um, London's research base. Mm -hmm. And we will actively support those firms and researchers to work directly with the market, whether it's the public sector, local authorities, Transport for London, for example, or the, or the private sector, to test, co-design and co-develop those innovations. Um, and hopefully support them to scale. So as I said, this is a small pilot program to test the approach. Should it be successful, um, we have big ambitions here to, to scale the approach up. And it should, this is a cross-cutting approach. Yeah, I, mean, I don't want to lose sight of where we are on Brexit at the moment. We're sort of drifting off a bit. I mean, Andrew, do you want to? Well, I want to come back to your first question, because in a sense, lots of the conversation we just had in relation to Brexit is about trying to understand the nature of what's going to happen. We can be fairly comfortable. All the different projections and studies suggest that any, any uh, alternative which is materially different from the present has a negative effect on all cities across the UK. And that's a standard position. All the models tell us. We can debate the degrees when you run from very soft to very hard, but in a sense it's negative. But it also tells us, at least the work that we've done with London School of Economics and others, is that obviously because of the nature of London's economy, it's also the best place to respond and react in a positive manner to the problems. This is not the same in other cities across the country who will be demonstrably affected by changes in trade in access or access to talent in a sense. They don't have the latent capacity and capabilities to respond in such a positive way. So to be kind of relative to these sorts of things. But much of what we talked about are competencies that lie elsewhere, either in national government, which obviously the mayor has a role to argue the case for London, or indeed international competencies. So coming back to your question, which is about what can we do, particularly picking up on this issue around you know, making more Londoners participate and benefit from the success that we've seen, and notwithstanding Brexit, the success we're likely to see, even if the growth rates are slightly lower, um, uh, than they are currently projected to be. He has two core competencies, right? You know, housing. Uh, London is the second most unaffordable city in the country. We simply do not build enough homes. That is directly within his control to build more homes, right? So there's housing issue, which has enormous effect on cost of living. It's the biggest outlayer of any individual, particularly at the lower end, whether they're renting or indeed they own, there is a housing question, and then there is skills. And the skills problems are primarily at the low and middle end. Right? If you look at the lower end, we are about mid-ranked in the UK compared to other cities in terms of about half a million of our uh, London residents don't have any qualifications whatsoever. Right? Puts six and a half percent. It's about mid-ranked in the UK. When you compare us against some other European cities, we are at the lower end. If you look at 330 European cities of all sizes, London on low skills and on medium skills right, is in the lower 200s and in the 300s out of 330. At the higher end, higher skills, no problem. Right? We have a system both in terms of producing graduates and attracting graduates from elsewhere currently, notwithstanding some changes that may or may not happen. It's not that the high skill then, the public policy has a problem. Again, adult education, FE, those are issues that the, the mayor has greater or lesser mm. control over. Those are the kind of things we should be thinking about. Mm. Other conversations are important, vision and all the rest of it. Those are very tangible policy interventions that can be made and will make a material difference to the lives of people at the lower end of the labour market. 
which is what I've been hearing from people around the room, is what you're, you're, you're concerned about. OK, well, last question for me. I think you've partly answered it already to Rajesh and anyone else wants to join you. about <coughs> what you see the key growth, key growth sectors being over the next 10 years. We've heard about green and we've heard about uh, high tech stuff. Anything else that you think is, is going to be a, a, a key factor? Uh, so there are quite a few sort of different uh, growth sectors that uh, I think, of course, a lot of them are technology. Uh, <coughs> um, but with technology comes its own challenges. So one is, like I said, skills, but also... Uh, yeah, so just before you go on, I take the point that Andrew's made about, and you've made also, about the need for um, higher skills, particularly at the lower end. Is it realistic to try and get the people who don't have these skills and qualifications into the sort of work that you're talking about? Or is, is, is migration always going to be the way that those gaps are filled? Well, London is a very diverse economy, so it's just not one particular sector. It's a lot of different sectors, and there are opportunities. Uh, you know, There can be opportunities for different people of different ages, at different levels, different skill sets. Um, of course, we'll still we are a thriving uh, economy, and... Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's important that we are sort of more and more uh, diverse. So skills uh, is one, but also one of the challenges with these technological changes is automation is happening more and more. Uh, it's incredible. I mean, I've visited some of the factories, incredibly more and more work within factories. Um, and even in, in the city now, in trading world, uh, more and more trading is happening through robots, essentially. Um, but there are certain jobs which are, which are at lower risk of automation, so for example, the jobs in cultural and creative industries, for instance. I mean, we've got a very fantastic cultural and uh, creative sector in London, so that is uh, uh, another one. And then the sort of advanced urban services uh, sector, so how do you make cities more efficient, uh, whether it's to do around transport, um, I mean, it could be anything to do with sort of urban sector. But of course, uh, London is the global financial capital, and it will still sort of continue uh, to thrive and uh, underpin. So that is uh, still <coughs> one of the sectors. Um, will passporting hit, hit, hit finance, the, or passporting not being permitted, which is what Bonnie is saying at the moment? Of course, the banks <coughs> are, uh, and the financial institutions are quite nervous uh, because they benefit significantly from having um, access to the EU market and through passporting means that they've got less bureaucracy and it also helps them in having less uh, sort of capital spent and spreading yeah. that liquidity because if they've got sort of different licenses in within the UK and the EU they need separate liquidity pool uh, which hampers their uh, which blocks their uh, cash so uh, I mean it's certainly financial and professional services but life sciences very fast-growing, fantastic sector <coughs> in London. London has got over 50 universities, four of which are among top 30 universities in the world. Uh, immediately, you know, that creates a big environment. Like, but is that affected easier. by the EMA moving away? By the is that affected by the EMA moving away? Um, so EMA is a European institution. It was, <coughs> you know, if we are not part of the EU, their view was that, you know. Yeah. No, I mean, it would go, that, that follows. Yeah. But will, it, will that have a, a knock-on effect on, on growth in life sciences? Well, I still think, I mean, you know, in, as far as the life sciences businesses are concerned, uh, we've got great talent uh, in London and we'll sort of, as long as, you know, that sort of continue and we remain open uh, as a city uh, to talent because a lot of people uh, in different sectors, uh, just like that in life sciences sectors, come from all over the uh, all over the world. Yeah, as you say, it's, it's also dependent on, on talent. talent. Uh, I think the Crick Institute told me there's something getting on for half of their scientists are yeah. non-UK non nationals. Yeah, I mean, that is the case with uh, a lot of sectors, but including universities, life sciences uh, sectors. So that's another one. Um, then, of course, the low carbon and environmental goods is another uh, area. I think it's a sort of fast-growing sector. Um, and then tourism. I mean, last year we had 19.1 million international tourists in London, uh, you know, more than ever before. Um, so it's a fast-growing sector. But again, uh, tourism sector is quite closely linked with the hospitality sector, in which well over 50% of the population is actually coming from outside of the UK. And also the drop in the value of the pound. Um, I mean, yeah, so right now there's, I mean, there's pros and cons around sort of dropping the uh, value of the cons. But tourism is another uh, 
uh, sort of fast growing sector which I think uh, can potentially thrive. So, I don't think Marion has not had anything, anything to say on any of these issues so far. Is there anything you want to add? I think, uh, I mean, lots of it's been covered already. I, mean, I agree with Andrew that housing is absolutely critical. It's the number one factor as to why we've got much higher poverty rates and uh, lots more. 3.3 million uh, Londoners uh, live below a decent standard of living. Um, a couple of other things I'll add in terms of challenges. I think one is the um, over-dependence on the central um, uh, activity zone. So London is too focused uh, on that being the driver of uh, growth. And how do you get that growth happening in other parts of the capital? So, uh, so what's talked about a lot in strategy is this transport challenge. Well, unless you have uh, jobs closer to where people live, um, and we've already got quite high density in central London, density is much lower in outer London, and lots of outer London boroughs just aren't delivering in terms of uh, housing affordability um, and delivery. So how do you get those jobs closer to those other parts of outer London? There's a huge mismatch. And other than what we've seen in Stratford uh, happening lately, I can't <coughs> see any other major developments. Old Oak Commons another one. But we actually need to see a change in scale in that happening. Um, and there is potential for that to happen. But, but that's... That's the kind of yeah. leadership that needs but to happen. Well, one of the problems particularly now to London is the primitive development rights, which, <coughs> which has led to lots of workplaces being converted to often substandard housing because you don't need planning permission or provide affordable housing or anything else like that. So offices and, and, yeah. and, 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 and office premises are converted. Yes. <coughs> I mean, that is, that, that's a huge problem. So um, the, the, and there are exemptions within central London and other districts but not in outer London, not where, outer where London. it's had a huge so, impact, counter to, well, going against what, what you're advocating. Yeah, I, and I think that's where we need to see the mayor much more uh, strongly campaigning on that issue and talking about this <coughs> transport challenge and the population challenge that we're facing, uh, if we are to see the good growth. Otherwise, it's all about funneling into the centre, which is going to lead to massive problems. Um, the other big problem, I think, is around young adults and the fact <coughs> that we do have an intergenerational issue um, uh, and that they are uh, being priced out of London. Um, so we've got issues, uh, big issues in relation to pay and the fact that the national minimum wage doesn't cover a large um, chunk of uh, young adults. and like to see much stronger action by the mayor on campaigning to uh, to change that. London can afford a higher uh, minimum wage and can afford to pay its young adults uh, a higher wage than that national minimum wage. So we'd like to see some change there. Um, and the fact that you know we have got very highly qualified uh, young adult population. So the best educational results is one of the been one of the best things that London has done over the past 10 to 15 years in improvements. We're not seeing that translating into better um, uh, employment rates for young adults. So outside of uh, uh, London, better employment rates for young, young adults in London, that's not, that's not happening. So there needs to be some way in which we can turn that around. Roger. So can I just quickly uh, respond to a couple of <coughs> points you, you made? Um, of course, you talk about housing, hugely, very, very, very important uh, uh, issue. Uh, but to me, it sits within the sort of wider affordability uh, thing, which we need to sort of make things more affordable. And for that reason, sort of, you know, I, I think I live in Zone 5 and you know, I commute to Zone 1 every day. Um, and that's why the sort of T the sort of TFL two fares are so important. Um, and freezing of the uh, um, TFL fares, which which the mayor did for four years, I think it's quite helpful in making transport more uh, affordable, including the Hopper fare. But on your point around sort of London living wage, I think you know we are leading by example. If you look at the sort of across GLA family, uh, uh, across uh, about eighty thousand people work, which is one and a half, one point four percent of London's workforce, um, and everybody is on sort of London uh, living wage. So, Mary is sort of leading uh, by example on that. 
And I totally agree on your point around the outer London or the Hamburg sort of big champion as somebody who lives in Zone 5. Why should everything should be about sort of Zone 1? We need to redistribute it across. Um, and um, especially now that these sort of work spaces, um, you know, are sort of cheaper in outer London boroughs and so on. There's more case because otherwise outer London boroughs are at risk to become effectively dormitories where you just live and then you sort of travel and commute to central London every day to work and then sort of go back. We need to develop local economies and uh, we are doing some of those thing, things to <coughs> affordable uh, workspace. Andrew, you done. done. Thank you. Um, why, before I move on to Susan, who's going to be um, asking about a fairer and more inclusive London economy, um, I had Sean, Fiona and Jeanette indicate during that last section of questioning, do you still want to come in? And in which case, Sean, do you want to go first? I, I, do. I, I just want to circle back about this question of, of the lower and the middle around skills and development because there's a there's a, a, a growing rump of Londoners who don't have access to what London has to offer. Um, when you talk about a highly qualified adult population in London, remember that the reason they're not getting employed, I would imagine, because they're competing internationally, not just with Londoners. But if you're born and bred in London and don't have that spectacular education, I don't see in here beyond warm words, how you're going to get access to this fairness. We all agree that fairness needs to happen, but where are the policies that, that are focused on people, a very growing group of people? We've seen it around the, the Olympic Development Site with the Convergence Report. You know, What's happening for those young people, and in many cases older people, where, where are they reflected in this plan? I can take that. Well, 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 uh, I mean, I, <clears throat> in terms of the problem, I think we're absolutely agreed. Um, what I'd say is that there is, of course, a skills strategy as well, which covers the detail of a lot of the kind of policies that you've highlighted. Um, we draw that out, obviously, in the economic development strategy, take it, you know, that skills strategy and this fundamentally sit together. I think certainly, you know, what we're attempting to do through the skills strategy, uh, which has been drawn up in, in you know, in, in parallel with a um, the mayor's um, skills task, skills for Londoners task force, which includes representatives both from uh, skills providers and from crucially uh, business, talking about the kind of skills that they need in their industries at all levels, um, and the. As, as is set out in here in, in principle, but is set out in the skills strategy in detail, what we're looking to do is very much to target those opportunities for <coughs> learning for the right kind of careers, along with good careers guidance to Londoners uh, from uh, more disadvantaged backgrounds to women, uh, to young BAME Londoners, uh, to ensure that those people who've previously been locked out of many of those skills opportunities and the career opportunities that derive from them are uh, you know, put front and centre in the way that we seek to deliver I, I, skills I, I, in London I, sorry, in the future. I, I more want to focus on, because we, I think we all agree on the school strategy, I want to, I want to talk about the, the institutions that are going to deliver those, even if you talk about the infrastructure. <coughs> so we have the Hopper Fair, that's great, but also we've, we've, we've um, stopped the extension on the Bakerloo line. We haven't done anything about the Metropolitan line. And what those kind of things do is make London even further out. So you live in Zone 5, I live in Zone 6. I live right out. And those young people want access to what the young people are getting in in Zone 1. Where are the institutions? Where is this supporting the, you know, the development of businesses locally but also the institutions are going to deliver that training well through 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 the uh, skills capital fund we are actually um, involved in around currently of awarding uh, actually quite significant amounts of capital to uh, a number of institutions um, uh, not exclusively in in central London I think there is one in in central London uh, the other institutions that we're on course to fund in the near future um, with their expansion plans, and, and uh, th these are plans that either deliver uh, brand new institutions or which help existing institutions to uh, expand quite, uh, in, in both in terms of overall numbers, but also into other areas of skills provision. Um, you, you know, those are very much um, looking at sort of, we, we obviously don't have the resource to say, mm -hmm. provide that funding to institutions in every single borough in one tranche, but certainly we're looking at those uh, outer boroughs certainly, and there, and there will be some uh, 
you know, good news to follow on that in the near future. But I, again, absolutely agree with the uh, problem as you've set it down. Can I address something just on that point? Yes. Because training and let's call it human capital isn't just done also through, say, public training programs. It used to also happen inside companies. And this is one of the worries I have about this over-focus on sort of SMEs and startups. You know, most SMEs actually are not very productive. They're not very innovative. They, they are not net creators of jobs, if you look at also how many jobs are destroyed. The few that are, which are, which are about 6% of SMEs, actually require patient long-term finance. We don't have that kind of finance in London or in the UK. We have very impatient speculative finance. But coming back to the skills, you know, skills are also an endogenous effect of the investment that occurs in companies. And when you have large financialized companies that are spending more on things like share buybacks than on investing in their people, training programs, and also R&D, um, that's a problem. And so I would encourage, because I think it's great, this good work standard sort of initiative, why don't you include in that issues around reinvestment? So these huge profits and wealth that are created in London, to get them reinvested in London, um, and perhaps also, you know, these apprenticeships, for example, that the government's been um, putting out in the last years, unfortunately, lots of those have, have ended up in sort of sandwich shops. <laughs> Why not also try to steer training and reinvestment and the apprenticeships <coughs> and sort of the whole value chain of these, not so much, again, just thinking about it sectorally, but companies that are willing to, you know, invest and you might want to have sort of a pick the willing kind of strategy, right? Like you put out some challenges and some missions and which companies are willing to engage with those missions will be rewarded perhaps through different types of, you know, investments <coughs> at the city level and the national level, but also with the focus of creating, um, you know, through investments, not just this whole issue of the directional push that I mentioned in the beginning, but also skills and the worry no, is that people are being pulled in o over the heads of many Londoners. Londoners now, if you're a small boy from Stratford, you're not competing with the small boy next door. You're competing with a girl from Copenhagen. And my worry about this whole conversation and the, and the, and the effect of Brexit, which when we spoke to businesses, wasn't, they seemed more interested in, in um, business rates than Brexit, quite frankly. It, we constantly talk about bringing people in to London. <coughs> what about the people already here? How are we supporting them? Because their outcomes are markedly worse than people who travel to London. But I'll stop my chair because Thank you, George. We're gonna, we're gonna start running out of time to get through everything. Fiona and then Jeanette, um, if you want to just yeah, finish my, my those question, questions on that um, section. My question links a bit to Sean's, but sort of um, goes into a bit more detail. And I've um, got two, two parts to it, really. One is about productivity and the extent to which it's... Um, it will prove difficult to upskill the workforce with the new economy, so the sort of gig economy and sort of zero hours contracts and the sort of flexible workforce that's developed over the last um, decade, really. Um, and then the other one is what work um, you're planning um, on automation and the challenges that automation will pose. Um, uh, you mentioned the strategy uh, is over the period up to 2041. And there'll be considerable automation during that time. So what work is being done now to sort of prepare London and Londoners for automation? So <clears throat> on, uh, I mean, uh, automation is, I think it's important that we, whilst automation is a big challenge, like any other technological challenge, we should not necessarily see it as a threat. We'll, it's a threat if you're not prepared for it. But if you're prepared for it and our uh, workforce is uh, skilled, uh, then we can use it to our advantage to improve productivity, uh, essentially. So, you know, the, the way to improve productivity is to, you know, invest more in technology um, and uh, to sort of upskill the workforce. And and that's the way. But I mean, but, you know, there are many many ways uh, in which sort of productivity can be improved. Whether it's from uh, you know improving the infrastructure, uh, improving the sort of making it regulations more. Uh, friendly, um, giving more. Uh, that's why things like Brexit pose a sort of bigger challenge uh, to productivity as well. Uh, uh, again, because it increases uh, the costs in, uh, for doing business in a lot of ways, which is um, uh, which is another sort of uh, challenge. Uh, but we, you know, people who are working in gig economy, and there is a rise in number of people who are in gig economy. Um, making sure that they are earning um, sort of minimum 
uh, is quite quite important because um, these people are at risk of being potentially exploited, uh, for instance, and that's why it's uh, you know the mayor is doing what uh, what he can to uh, to protect uh, those people. Um, can, I, can I can I go back on the bit about people working in the gig economy though, in terms of productivity and the opportunity to sort of upskill? <coughs> if people in the gig economy, um, the only option they have at the moment appears to be to work longer hours. Um, where is the opportunity, both in terms of time and who would be offering them that that skills training to allow them to sort of progress and actually be become more productive? Um, in their own right, but actually sort of contribute to the wider productivity within London's economy. So it was really that I was driving at. And uh, again, agreeing with sort of Mariana's point on that, so the companies need to sort of invest uh, in training uh, the people who work within the company, now whether they work as an employee or in sort of gig economy, but they are the ones who are actually contributing to the revenues of those companies, uh, whether you want to call them employees or uh, whatever, but they are the people who are driving revenues uh, for these companies. So investing in training uh, and personal development of uh, these people is very important, and that's why it's sort of part of the sort of good good work standard as well. Mm -hmm. uh, constantly providing opportunities for uh, personal development, because that's one one of the things that has been. I think we've been slow in this country and in in our sort of city in terms of sort of personal development uh, of uh, of people. And that is also again sort of focusing on sectors like I mentioned a uh, number of sectors uh, earlier on, uh, which are at lower risk of automation. Mm. Uh, you know, and we are very good at it. Um, you know whether it's uh, around sort of culture and creative industries, um, and so on, which are at, uh, even in life sciences <coughs> at lower risk because it's all around talent and innovation. Um, focusing a little bit uh, more on that, uh, but using people to uh, making sure people are prepared uh, because quite a few things can be done by automation but automation is not going to come overnight um, there's a saying that it's always easy to um, overestimate the impact of technology in the short term and very easy to underestimate the impact of technology in the long run um, and I think we need to think more longer run in it rather than feeling sort of threatened on sort of in the next two years. Can I just add, add to that? Is that okay? So, um, just to add to what Rajesh has already said, from a cross sectoral perspective, um, as the adult education budget is devolved, um, we will be setting up a sector skills board. And as part of that, the various subsectors will be um, developing their own skills plans, which will be partly addressing that, that very issue in order to inform future provision. In terms of the, the uh, lower paid and lower skilled sectors, we are currently working with IPPR mm -hmm. um, to set up a program that will look at more innovative ways of addressing these issues of low <coughs> pay and low skills in, in these sectors and the impact that technology will have. In addition to that, we do have um, obviously several programs which try to um, address low levels of digital literacy, digital exclusion, we've got a digital inclusion strategy coming out this year, um, we have um, focused provision on addressing basic skills including digital skills and we also have the 7 million um, mayors digital talent program which directly links up the needs of digital businesses with the provision coming forward and helps to, to co-shape and co develop that um, targeting young people I think it's 16 to 24 so we are trying to approach this very challenging issue from a number of different angles and I think data needs to be at the heart of this and we are putting data at the centre of this so that's data on supply data on demand <coughs> data on future trends and ensuring everyone has access to that data Done. And finally, Jeanette, um, before uh, I bring Susan in. No, Chair, because it, it was interesting when I wanted to ask the question, and it was about data and information, and it was a processy question, because what was missing for me uh, from the responses from you, um, Rajesh, not so much Ben, was a sense that um, some work had been done and uh, there was an overview of a London that um, areas needed urgent targeting. Um, I think, um, uh, moving the stuff you were saying, that there were areas that needed um, urgent action on so many levels, 
Um, and then there was, if you like, being in the middle of this Brexit storm. I wasn't getting that from you, Rajesh, that this had been sort of, you know, something that you guys had done in understanding the issue. Um, and it was only until Catherine came in here and I'm now understanding that there's work going on in commissioning work that it seems to me will then underpin um, the next stage <coughs> of this document. So my question was, in terms of timeline, what real timeline are you dealing with? Not the 2041, please, but in terms of immediate interventions and actions, um, what sort of timeline? And if you haven't got some of the data yet, yeah. then when would you get that? And also, who will you be working with? Um, there seems to be, to be no place of landing in the document. I haven't got a clue whether you'll be working with partners, with, as uh, uh, Marianne was saying, with a greater private sector on delivering this, or local government. So it was processy things that I was struggling with, and Catherine has helped a little bit. Do you want me to answer that a little bit, a little bit further, just, just quickly, in terms of delivery, we'll be looking at 2019. <coughs> However, the final EDS will, make, will be much, much clearer um, in terms of what the deliverable what the deliverables are and when they will be happening. In terms of partnership working, we have the Skills for Londoners Task Force, under which will sit the Sector Skills Board, and we're obviously working very closely with the Business Advisory Board and with the LEAP. Um, London is a big place. Clearly, we're working therefore very closely with local authorities and with sub-regional partners who are helping us to engage businesses across London to feed in their views as well. Um, so I can make sure that that comes across much more clearly in the final strategy. And just to follow that up, um, I represent Hackney, and it's a borough where the activity, um, the people who work in Hackney, in the techno section or whatever, they come <coughs> from the southeast. That's what transport is so important to them. So is there going to be some link with what's happening around London? Because if you're just uh, talking about London and... I haven't heard you made reference to the 32 boroughs. It's London up here somewhere, as this wonderful global city where we Londoners are down here wanting action. Um, are you going to be linking up with some of the uh, southeast development activities that are happening? And when wh when would you expect to to be doing that so that you could give us some insight into the final document, the wider southeast? Yeah, there, sh there should be an adult skills statement that will be published, I think it's this year, which will set out some of that detail um, off the back of the consultation that's currently out for the um, skills strategy. I'll, I, will, I will need to check with the team and get back to you, but that is my understanding that that level of detail will be in the skills statement. Right, so we'll be able to understand when Raj talks about his talent where that what, talent what's is coming where, from. Let, let me check with the skills team and get back to you. Thank you. I'm now going to move to Susan, and I'm going to hand over to you completely, okay. Susan. To you, okay. Susan's got one question to pick up Thank on this you. last bit, and we'll then be delving into fairness <coughs> and inclusivity. Thank you. There's just one very quick point, if I can ask you, please, uh, Moby. You said that London can afford to pay higher pay rates. Can you just tell me where you got the evidence of that? <coughs> so, uh, we did two studies with the Centre for London. Uh, it was researched by Kitty Usher, uh, who uh, was in government previously, uh, and we looked at the minimum wage um, and uh, what uh, London could afford to pay, uh, how, how much of what percentage of the workforce was currently covered by the minimum wage in London and the rest of the UK. It was a much smaller. Uh, proportion of the workforce here in London. So I'm happy to share that information with you. Uh, but we felt that uh, by increasing it, I can't remember the exact figures, but you could increase it um, at least to the um, national minimum wage, our current minimum wage um, uh, for everyone, and actually go beyond that without having <coughs> a impact. Now, 
obviously any of that modelling is uh, is problematic. So when the uh, minimum wage was first brought in, there were uh, lots of economists saying, well, we're going to see millions of people unemployed and it's going to have a detrimental impact on the economy and we didn't see anything like that. But our best guesstimate is that London can afford to pay a higher wage at the bottom. OK, if you could send that, I'd be interested, because obviously there's lots of people in different sectors that are struggling quite substantially. And um, so many people are employed by very small employers who are suffering um, quite substantially. So I'd, if you could send that, I'd be really grateful. Going into uh, my questions now, and it's um, headed a fair and more inclusive London economy. I'm very uh, happy, Rajesh, to hear that uh, you and the Mayor want high, higher living standards and lower costs. We all would love that. So how, then, Rajesh, um, will the policies in the EDS help to keep, to keep the cost of living down for Londoners, and particularly, obviously, those that are on low income? So, <clears throat> I mean, cost of living uh, is, uh, there are a sort of number of things in that, um, and affordability is quite key, because like we were discussing earlier, um, London, a lo lot of things are quite unaffordable for a lot of people uh, these days, you, you know, so there are two aspects to it, making uh, London more affordable as a city uh, to live, but also uh, making sure people are getting uh, sort of paid uh, on a sort of fair basis through the uh, London uh, living wage. So we've got a, a number of things. So for example, um, if you look at the child, uh, child care affordability, um, the strategy sets out how the mayor will tackle affordability issues from child care affordability to transport affordability. Also, um, it's set out in the transport uh, strategy. So one is, the, like I mentioned, the um, freezing of all TFL fares until 2020 and introducing the new Hopper fare, which uh, certainly uh, helps uh, towards um, uh, affording uh, transport. But then we've got the fuel poverty action uh, plan, uh, which will look at um, uh, making sure that the sort of uh, fuel uh, is more uh, affordable. Uh, but we are also devising a food strategy uh, in sort of working with local authorities uh, on the food poverty action uh, plans. Um, but in, see, all, one of the other things as my sort of own background is from financial uh, technology, FinTech. Um, financial inclusion uh, is also quite uh, important, uh, particularly for young people to make sure they've got access to uh, bank accounts or banking-like facilities. Uh, is, is quite important. So providing things like uh, free debt service, uh, uh, debt advice services, uh, increasing in uh, sort of financial literacy among young people. And some of these things uh, will be uh, sort of uh, developed further. But childcare affordability, um, again, uh, is quite important. And the mayor is funding three new mayor's early years hub from early this year. Uh, these hubs will bring childcare settings together to collaborate over a three-year period. Yes, we do, we do, actually we've done work, some a very useful work on several of the things you've mentioned. But what what is that actually is he going to do um, <clears throat> to keep the cost of living down for everyone? So we I need mean, to. If I you mean, haven't got children. I mean, one of the <laughs> obviously uh, housing is a big cost uh, for 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 most people. I mean, housing is is it's a huge cost if you are, especially if you are renting. The rents have uh, gone up uh, because there's so much uh, demand. Uh, so the solution really is to build more houses. Frankly, I mean, that's that's what that's why the mayor has set himself very ambitious uh, target every year to build more he's, and more he's, affordable. He's certainly um, putting ambitious targets in there, but not reaching them. I mean, that's all very well if the population doesn't increase drastically because then the demand is still going to be going up and the supply at some point you could you, you if your demand forever goes up and up and up and up and up um, the market is going to rule that it stays that the, the cost of housing is still going to be there yeah but if you have to increase the supply the only way is sort of we have to make it more affordable uh, is sort of its demand and supply we can't control demand, uh, frankly. I mean, you know, if anything, uh, in fact, uh, recently there was sort of 
uh, lowering of the stamp duty at sort of certain levels. I mean, that for the fuels demand, actually, it doesn't necessarily solve the okay. supply side of things. So what we need is more uh, supply, and that's why more affordable housing need to be built. And there are things uh, like um, Andrew mentioned earlier on sort of permitted right developments and so on, uh, which means it's sort of, um, um, it's, it's it, it, it's linked into that because in a way it's um, <coughs> creating more sort of luxury flats. Do you, did you want to come in on this? Yeah. Just quick, what is the best target for housing in London? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's set out in the sort of housing. Uh, I don't have the number to go on. What, what I'd just add to what Rajesh was saying before is, of course, we're not here to discuss the housing strategy. Um, what I would say is that the key interlink here is that starting principle of good growth. The good growth principles that, are set, that were originally set out in the City for All Londoners document which preceded the statutory strategies as well as the non-statutory ones and set out the overarching uh, Mayor's vision. Uh, that sets the tone for, first and foremost, the London plan which is the, if you like, overarching strategy, uh, and then the economic development strategy, the housing strategy, which are very much written to uh, intrinsically complement each other and, if you like, form one coherent whole. So the key principle within good growth is that, uh, on, on this front, is that as we grow our economy and our population, that housing growth... Uh, happens apace with that, and that when we consider inputs like um, the uh, uh, such as um, growing population and employment growth, we're also considering where that employment growth ha happens uh, in relation to where the development of new housing is taking place within the overall envelope. So I, I, I just want, I just want to answer to my sorry. question: What is the housing target? Sure, we've we've established we're not here on the housing. I fully accept committee. that, but we've been completely talking about the fact that inclusivity in this town, the biggest cost is housing. That is that we can all agree on. What is the housing target? I, I don't need a long explanation. Just what is the number? What is the mayor's number? Where does it sit? Is is any of you able to? I mean, I mean it's chair. Can, I understand we, can, we, can we get that sent, to, sent to you later? And I'll bring it in measures. It, 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 no, it should be built. Bring, bring that in, in later. Measures. Susan, continue. Uh, and well, I, 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 I'm, I'm Mariana just, wanted to come in. Yeah, I, I want to bring Mariana in a, in a minute as well. I, I am surprised, given that you are all linking housing in with this, yeah. um, and Andrew did right from the beginning, that and skills as being the most important thing. I therefore think that you should know the, the uh, target for housing, because clearly it's very important. Did you want to join in on that little bit, Mariana? Or? Well, just, I, I think the key issue is that there is a lack of integration between these different strategies, <coughs> right? I mean, it doesn't really make sense to have a housing strategy that doesn't speak to the economic strategy and vice versa. And I just wonder if it's also just a, a planning issue. But, you know, before when, um, I think it was Andrew who said, okay, you know, Mariana's talked about green, talk, you know, talk to me about another sector. That's the issue, which is, to be honest, green, a serious green strategy would require all the different sectors, I've already said this, to interact, and housing is central. We don't have a serious sort of green housing strategy and construction, the people who are actually constructing housing in this country are, are actually quite low skilled. They haven't been part of an innovation agenda. So when you come back to you know, talking about the youngsters who have different opportunities, part of that is that we have, as I mentioned before, serious corporate governance issues, so lack of reinvestment of these mega financial profits back into London, but also that the actual companies, whether they be in construction or life sciences, are not actually being pressured, if you want, by the city through its different problems to invest in a particular way or to collaborate in a particular way. And you know, when, so if you look at Germany, what's been fascinating is they haven't asked themselves which sector, you know, is it low tech, is it high tech? Steel, you know, a boring sector like steel has had to massively modernize and change itself in order to work with not just Berlin's, but the nation's green strategy. So steel in Germany, unlike steel here, has lowered its material content through repurpose, reuse, and recycle. It's, it's innovated in order to be green. And each one of those, repurpose, reuse, and recycle, have all sorts of services that are being supplied in order for that agenda to be met. And those are people who are being upskilled in order to provide those <coughs> services. So I really 
uh, challenge you to not think, not just sectorally, but also not high tech versus low tech. Every sector, every sector, especially those that we currently think are low tech, should be engaged in sort of a modernization transformational strategy. And if you look down their whole supply chain, that would require lots of you know, uh, uh, people who currently are earning little and aren't being skilled up because they're seen as just sort of, you know, picture, static picture, you're in a low skilled job, so at best you can receive some government handouts to be part of this much more integrated and systemic strategy. And so maybe one of the issues is for the next round to make sure that the housing, the transport, the, you know, clean city strategy are talking to, each, all talking to each other about the issue of what kind of growth, what does good growth mean? Um, but you know all the maintenance work that would actually require us to get a green growth strategy that means people don't just buy things and throw, and throw them away, means actually upskilling people who could be doing maintenance. I mean that's just a, a sort of a, a, an example. But by not having a sort of integrated systemic mission oriented strategy, the people that currently are very low down on the productivity and income scale are definitely going to stay there. They're, they're not going to be served just by a redistribution strategy. Okay, can I ask Andrew, uh, do you know if there are any examples of where city government has achieved the goal of keeping the cost of living down? Uh, yeah, there's quite a few examples, but it's predominantly to do with the fact that uh, their economies are not very successful. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, it's a glib response, but it's a serious point. It picks up this point we had a conversation about earlier on, which is about inequality and equality. The most equal cities in this country by the Gini coefficient mm. are actually the weakest economically, right? So Burnley mm. and Hull Everybody's and Blackburn, poor. they are very equal, mm. right? London, Cambridge, mm. Oxford, <coughs> Brighton, Reading, they mm. are unequal, mm. right? By those measures, right? Mm. So, and it's not because all of those places have people at the lower end of the uh, skill spectrum or the wage spectrum, What's absent in Hull or in Blackburn or in uh, these other places, Burnley, are people at the higher end. Mm. Okay, so just I, I, I make no more than that as an observation mm. that we throw around these words mm. inequality and, and all the rest of it. Mm. Uh, and we just need to be very careful about what we are talking about, firstly. Secondly, <coughs> what we heard in response to dealing with some of those issues at the top end, as I've said many, many times, are outside the competence mm. of the mayor. Where the mayor can most in intervene and have significant effect is improving the living standards, absolute living standards, at the lower end of the income spectrum, the labour market, however you define it. Okay, so we just need to be very, you know, just be mindful about those sorts of questions when we talk about what we'd like to see happen, and what we're actually talking about here is what's the mayor going to do? What can he do through this strategy and then other strategies? Well, I, I get the feeling that the strategy is more what we'd all we'd all like to see happen, but I, I, I completely take your point. I mean, if, if you had to look at other cities, which obviously you, you do, what one thing in your view would help to keep the cost of living down? Build more housing. Still back to housing again. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Um, sorry, can I, I sort of just, I'm, I'm sorry, but this is quite controversial what I was just said. Can I just suggest a, a possible example of why that's not so? So the UK has one of the highest ratios of private debt to disposable income, right? So people, it's not just that we don't have enough housing, people are being asked to buy homes and they're helped through the help to buy schemes to buy homes they actually cannot afford because wages have not been rising. If you look at Berlin, people are not buying, buying, buying. I mean, not only do they actually have real wages that are increasing faster, but a social housing, which doesn't have to be seen as just sort of low income housing, but a program that actually had affordable rent and social housing is also just a different model. And these huge profits in London are not unrelated to this high private debt if you look at where the high profits are in the financial sector, which is thriving on people taking on debt they cannot pay back. The mayor can't do anything about that. Of course he can. He can have a social housing program. Yeah, you know, he can have a social housing program. Yeah, Absolutely. but that means people don't take on more homes. debt, which that's then feeds the more financial homes. sector. That's a, that's a question no, about, it's particular it's, it's kinds of homes. It's building more homes, and then there's a distribution question. It's green, retrofitted homes, which is better skills. It's people not having to buy homes, so they stop taking out, un, uh, you know, they cannot take out more and more debt. So those are two things right there. Green, 
retrofitted homes, not just homes, build any kind of home, build bridges, roads, and homes. No, these are you know shovel-ready projects don't actually get us long-term growth. So what kind of homes? Green homes. And also, do we actually want people to keep taking out massive debt to buy homes versus being a city like Berlin that has an affordable housing slash social policy so, for homes? So for point of clarification, I never said the tenure. I just simply said we need to supply more homes. That's a first order question. Second order question is, at what rate are they are they rented out or are they are they made available to the market? I don't disagree with Mariana, but the first order question is, we simply do not supply enough yeah. homes in London. The type, the flavour, what the front door looks like, etc. Those are all important. They are second order questions to the primary problem that we've got. Which is we don't build enough homes. I love a good argument because we can all learn so much. I mean, I can see, I can see what you're both saying. So, which is good. Normally, I have a completely different view. <laughs> right. Okay. Did Did anybody else want to come on that before I go? I was just going to say something about about Hull. Oh uh, and one thing that I knew already, and which came out of our visit also, is that Hull's problem is looking not just the city but the immediate East Riding because the wealthy people living near the East Riding mm. just beyond the whole border. Mm and they pay their rents and their taxes just outside the whole board in places like Beverly and, and Harrow and so forth. So Hull misses out on, on that. So if you're talking about inequality in Hull, yeah, I think you've got to look at the immediate hinterland as well. Same issue if you looked at London. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. All the wealthy people live outside London. Mm. <coughs> okay, I mean, the next question, I'll pose it, but unless you've got something different to say, it's, it's pretty similar. Um, it's to all of you. Is it helpful and realistic for the mayor to actively seek to lower <coughs> the cost of living and make London a more affordable city? I, I would simply give a, a simple answer, which is yes. I mean, that, that, that's clearly the mayor's view. Um, again, I, I'd go back to this point that, you know, we are really talking about very much an overarching uh, aim, which is delivered both through the economic development strategy, um, which I would say, al although both reducing the cost of living and um, increasing access to employment and skills are, are, are both two sides of, if you like, the same coin, this strategy is perhaps more, slightly more concerned with increasing employment opportunities and skills. Um, you will find, for example, in housing, as we've said, um, and in the transport strategy, more detail on how we're going to reduce the costs of, of, of transport and how we're going to increase supply of housing to meet the mayor's targets and so forth. Okay, I mean, should the mayor concentrate his efforts on developing policies to remove barriers to work and opportunities, for example, and it targets specific segments of the population in the process? <coughs> That's certainly what we set out to do through the economic development strategy. Any other? Well, I, so one of the projects that uh, my organisation is involved in is the What Work Centre for Local Economic Growth. Uh, one of the tasks of that uh, centre has been to review the evidence base across a wide range of policy interventions. Right? Um, looking across the OECD, 30 years plus, to try and understand high quality evidence of impact. So a lot of stuff is low quality, tells us nothing about impact, much of what actually happens. So when you get into the, into the detail of what, what we, what we seem to know more about, what the evidence base is kind of telling us when we think about economic development interventions, is that there is a reasonable evidence base that tells us that impact can be achieved, particularly on dealing with some of the supply side issues, mm -hmm. skills, right? We know pretty well what works in terms of helping people on the margins of the labour market to get into labour market, into the labour market, and actually to increase their wages and increase their employment uh, opportunities. When we get to the business side, stuff that's in the EDS, our confidence in the evidence is half of what it is for labour market interventions. So basically, we do a lot of stuff, we don't really know the effects that it has. It's a kind of non, you know, it's a non-trivial point about aspirations and, and, you know, trying to do things, particularly on the demand side of the economy. Actually, the evidence base in the micro spaces around actual interventions that make a difference. One in four interventions we have any confidence in the business support environment have some causal impact on what we're trying to target, and even then, 
we're not entirely sure how they relate to the wider environment and indeed to the to the people more beyond the actual firm that we target. We understand that we can improve a lot of the firm, but the spillovers from that firm elsewhere are pretty limited, right? But we understand how to improve the skills of people, how to help them get jobs and progress in jobs. There's a good evidence base around that. So the answer, long, that's a long answer. Short answer is yes. Um, so I live in London and I have four children who all go to state schools and um, my kids at home have certain types of opportunities which their friends don't and what I've witnessed in the last five years through the closure of youth centres and, and just, just in my area, North, um, North London, closure of libraries, closure of after school programmes, you know, which I might be able to hire a babysitter, some other people can't, has had a huge effect on <coughs> local community issues, but also crime. The amount of knife crime just in my area, the amount of young teenagers dying, by the way, this should be documented in London, it is very high. I think um, Gary Young, the journalist, is actually starting to look into this much more, even just scientifically, what are the numbers, what do we know? You know there is a relationship. I, I sort of beg to differ on this thing that we don't know. When you do cut programs, and these are London-based programs, for teenagers who are disadvantaged, there is a result quite quickly. This doesn't take years. It, it occurs within months. Um, sorry, were you saying it's not true? Yeah. Um, because if you go back into the history of London, we never quite had this level of, quite frankly, anarchy amongst young people. And we also never had the same level of in intervention that we have now. Also, when you talk about those things being mm -hmm. cut, there's other things that exist that didn't, that provide opportunities to poor people in London that are more important. So I am a poor Londoner, I was born here, I am a youth worker of 27 years, it's much more important for my children to get access to good education. London's education has, um, output has increased markedly over the years than it is for them to get lo access to a local It's not a trade-off, it's not either invest in but, education but that's or invest in youth programs. But in public finance terms, it has been the trade-off. It might yeah. not be, it might not be in, in, in terms in how you want your community to be built, but in public finance train terms, that has been the trade-off. No, no, but that's that's a very good point, and I would agree. But it shouldn't be a trade-off, and that comes back. It, it to might, it might, and shouldn't be. You and I can agree or disagree on that. But the point is, it has been, and I, I just, I just draw the point. I'm a youth worker again of 27 years. It, it's a tiny bit. Those things have been elevated above certain things. The, the, the condition of your family, its mental health, is much more important than any of those things. So if you're going to spend the money, you'd spend it there. Okay, I'm going to move us on. Um, Fiona. Uh, would you like to take us on to the next section of questions, which is creating conditions for growth? Thank you. Um, question for uh, Rajesh. Rajesh first. Um, what will the Mayor's approach be to generating growth? And I know you've already touched on this a bit, but um, what's, what's the general approach that the Mayor will be taking to generating growth? So the uh, EDS supports growth through ensuring uh, London provides a competitive business environment for firms of all sizes and sectors to grow and ensuring Londoners can access these growth opportunities through focused measures uh, on up or reskilling where necessary targeting training um, interventions at groups typically underrepresented in growth areas such as STEM and linking it, uh, this directly to business demand. Uh, policies to tackle inequality cut across the strategy. For example, we target business growth support at groups who may be less likely to access business support uh, services. Um, high streets are very, very uh, important uh, aspect, and small business owners particularly, SMEs are very, very uh, important to London's economy. Almost 50% people who work <coughs> in London work for SMEs. 99.8% um, of all um, businesses in London are classified as SME. So we'll be uh, working with boroughs and other stakeholders to support uh, uh, sort of competitive and diverse retail sectors, especially uh, for the sort of high streets. I mean, they're facing big challenges with the online uh, shopping um, and so on on the rise. Um, so supporting communities to develop and uh, understanding of the economic, social and physical condition of their town centres and high streets, encouraging stewardship from local residents and businesses <coughs> in order to maximise the uh, local economic uh, opportunities, using the mayoral and LEAP funds to stimulate local economic activity which creates attractive and welcoming high streets that draw in 
visitors and considers alternative uses of empty shops, disused buildings, vacant land and reuse spaces. I mean, th this is a great example is uh, affordable workspace uh, is, is a challenge in London uh, increasingly. I think the use of some of the sort of disused spaces, meanwhile spaces, uh, something that uh, we are working with, very, very uh, important. And we need to protect uh, the um, and prevent the uh, loss of viable office space, um, which are uh, under threat from the sort of housing development. Um, improving public transport connections uh, and uh, public realm, making walking and cycling to and around town centers more appealing and reducing car dependencies. So this is all part of the healthy streets uh, uh, approach. Uh, promote connectivity and innovation, um, including better public Wi-Fi and embedded technologies using Internet of Things. Um, and that's why the mayor's also uh, appointed um, London's first ever chief digital officer uh, to look at uh, a more sort of digital uh, inclusion because um, in the sort of going forward, um, digital connectivity is a very, very uh, important uh, part of um, supporting economic growth. Uh, but just supporting SMEs uh, in general, by and large, uh, through our various programs that we do through, for example, London Growth Hub, uh, which is a unique tool. It's a signposting website uh, where SMEs can go and look for affordable co-working spaces. Uh, they can look for uh, uh, sort of mentoring. They can uh, look for a calendar of events where they can network. They can uh, join master classes for various things. Uh, for example, you know how to use technology and social media uh, for their businesses. <coughs> I mean, it's not as if social media is only for large businesses. SMEs and small retailers can benefit uh, significantly from it. And if as they start sort of growing. Uh, help them grow through London Business Growth Program, um, but uh, uh, and when they are ready to export using the Mayor's International Business Program that we run via London and Partners to help them export uh, and look at sort of new markets uh, as well. But reducing the barriers for for SMEs, I mean, the best thing we can do is creating the right kind of environment by taking off some of the barriers. For example, access to finance. Um, so the mayor announced a uh, £100 million SME fund. Um, <clears throat> um, Civic Innovation Challenge <coughs> Workspace uh, uh, Board to tackle the challenges around affordable uh, workspace, uh, but also to showcase uh, the great talent we have. Um, so for example, um, in the sort of growing startup scene, uh, there are still certain areas where the startups are unable to raise a lot of funds so bringing investors and startups who are specializing in those areas together um, through our Tech Invest program, uh, which is a fantastic program which brings sort of angels, um, and we are doing it along with the UK Business Angels uh, Network. So there are uh, all these sort of things, but we need to work with sort of public, uh, public and private sector, uh, third sector, and London uh, boroughs uh, to deliver this. I mean. It all cannot be just delivered from here. So in making sure that we are working with all different London boroughs to make it more equitable and inclusive. And that's partly is the reason we are sort of here as well sort of discussing this. This is a draft strategy. Take all the feedback that you give us today on board. Yeah, um, thank you. And I'd like to bring other guests in now, starting with um, Mubin. Um, uh, the Deputy Mayor mentioned sort of inclusivity. I just wonder whether you could comment on what extent you think the mayor's approach will contribute to his economic fairness goals. I mean, as, as I said earlier, the tone is fair. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, poverty and inequality, and there's mention of particular groups. What we'd like to see more of is what that actually means in practice. Um, the, let, let's take disability, for example. We've got a huge amount <coughs> in terms of uh, disability employment. The government's actually pulled back yeah. from its earlier targets uh, that had in terms of how it's going to halve that gap. What we could see is a mere actually taking much more of a lead on that and saying, you know, this is one of our, one of our big 
goals we talk about trying to prioritize particular groups now we've seen um, you know a, a big growth of employment in London over the past um, a decade or so uh, more record numbers of people in employment um, we're now starting to get to the really hard groups now of which uh, people uh, disabled people are, are big uh, a large number of that and you do need much more dedicated and targeted campaigns and programs to um, get those people into work now he's got the, he, he's, he's getting the powers on the work and health program um, to do part of that but actually it's quite limited in, in terms of the funds that there are available in order to get the scale that you require much more resources required so really making the case for that to government and also using the skills budgets that there are. Um, I'd also like to see much more happening in relation to second earners. There's very little in the uh, development strategy in relation to that. So uh, when the previous, previous mayor looked at uh, child poverty, Ken Livingston, uh, and uh, looking at why we did have such uh, high poverty rates in London, the, single biggest factor that they saw was the fact that uh, many women still were not uh, uh, working to their full potential state, <coughs> taking, um, being outside of the labour market. So how can we increase that? So I'd like to see much more ambition, resource in trying to do that. We've got some voluntary organisations working on that, people like Time Wise and Working Families, but that should be a really core cool part of what's at the, within the good work standard uh, and we're um, championing that as well really within the GLA family and within uh, uh, its procurement practice. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, um, in your own experience and, and research, are the key measures or policies that the draft strategy is missing to reduce inequality, what, what more would you like to see? What more would we like to see in terms of tackling inequality? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think there's a bit of controversy uh, on the panel as to what do you do about the top, really, and whether or not actually that leads to less growth overall. And there is mixed evidence in relation to that. One of the things the Mayor did say in um, uh, his uh, in the strategy was how do you measure uh, the ultimate... Uh, whether or not this is working and he talked about health well-being and happiness mm -hmm. one of the things we do know about inequality when you've got the sort of extremes is that uh, you don't get as much happiness in relation to that and it has detrimental impacts on health so I think that's one area where we'd, we'd like to see a, a bit more attention, a bit more focus as to what the mayor could do. We did fund the um, London Fairness Commission, mm. which Toynbee Hall was leading uh, a couple of years ago, just when the mayor uh, gone to power. That outlined a number of recommendations in which, which he could take forward, a number of which relate to employment, a lot which relate to housing, things like council tax um, and supply, of housing, but um, uh, you know, I think it needs more further exp exploration as to what can be done at the London level. Like, set lot a lot of this is outside of what the mere can actually do. <coughs> Much of this relates to central government and actually to the wider uh, 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 global economic uh, situation rather than what happens here in London. But there are elements that can be achieved. Okay, thank you. Um, Andrew, Mariano, have you got anything to add to that particularly? Your, your question was about metrics, wasn't it? Um, um, it was about um, whether the mayor's approach will contribute to his goal of economic fairness. So, I mean, I would just go back to my first point that currently I think the challenge in the plan and what would really transform it in order to um, achieve performances that it might not is if it can actually uh, create more integration between how it's thinking about whether it's transport, housing, sustainability and inclusive growth and I would just really welcome the team, I guess Catherine's team, who's thinking about the economic strategy to create less of a potential trade-off between, you know, here's our sort of green, green roof strategy, here's the inclusive growth strategy, here's the skill strategy. 
you know, green skills and all the services that would be around that would also mm -hmm. be able to upskill people that currently are just sort of left behind. Lots of the low end, um, low income people working in the construction industry should not be left out of an innovation strategy. And in order to remedy that, we need a linking up of an innovation skill strategy with the green strategy and how we think about the kind of services that London needs. The current, as I mentioned in the beginning, the current types of services we have are not fueling growth in the real economy. They're fueling growth in the financial sector, which is in fact driving the 1%. So this is not about taxing the 1% and taking this defensive strategy, mm -hmm. as important as taxation is, but taking a much more offensive <coughs> strategy around what kind of wealth creation do we want. And this is where I kind of find problematic the whole discussion about Brexit. I am you know, as Remainer as one can be, but the problems in London existed before Brexit. So as much as that conversation should be had, because of course every region should be able to sort of manage the problem, which currently, by the way, is being managed by four consulting companies. Someone should document just how much <laughs> UK <laughs> income is being wasted on allowing the top four consulting companies to manage Brexit. But let's just keep that to the side. As important as it is to manage Brexit, the whole issue of steering growth in a different way in terms of long-term finance, definancialization of the corporate sector so they reinvest profits back in, lining up a green strategy with an innovation strategy, that is just as true and needed pre-Brexit and post-Brexit. Thank you. Andrew, have you got anything to add? No. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Should I bring in Jeanette now? Um, yes, Chair. Continue on creating conditions for growth. Further yes. questions. Um, I've got um, some questions on um, space and entrepreneurship and um, uh, innovation and skills. Um, but, uh, Chair, if you, if you bear with me, I, I just want to ask, in terms of space and uh, it's fit, whether the space we have is fit for purpose to enable business, let me just read to you what um, a, um, a constituent of mine who's picked up this um, uh, investigation just emailed me and said, um, that's all very well what you're talking about, but what about those businesses who the mayor seem unable to help? Basically, this person has been working or been talking with the major providers for um, optic cable. This is in N1, so this is just up the road from Tech City. And he is really now pulling his hair out because after two years, he's no further forward in getting cable into his business, which is now seriously affecting his business. Now, this is um, a business um, who must be at the heart of growth small, so we'll have um, some workers in there, dependent on the salary. Now, if, if uh, the providers, <coughs> the, the BTs and the NTLs and the virgins, don't see fit to actually kit him up to do his business, do you know about this sort of thing? And are you saying that this business is in isolation? Do you know of this issue? And don't you have to address issues like that before you go off talking about jobs in the future that you have absolutely no idea what those jobs will be? What about sorting out the jobs of now that are helping um, workers, and uh, not well paid, many of them, um, to, you know, uh, what should I say to this guy? Ben, you're nodding. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I mean, I mean look, the, uh, to address one of the specific questions you asked, are we aware of this problem and is it isolated or not? The answer is no, it's not isolated. And yes, we're very much aware of the problem. And, uh, you, you know, the, um, it, it, it is uh, damaging to London's competitiveness and productivity, quite frankly. <coughs> Our digital infrastructure is not currently uh, where it should be. Uh, one of the, uh, well, that, that's exactly why the mayor's created a new team in City Hall, a new connectivity 
uh, team, uh, which um, is now working to address uh, specific challenges such as not spots and particularly with uh, the new chief digital officer who has this as part of his remit, is working to engage local authorities as well as the private sector including those providers that you've mentioned in trying to identify some of the challenges and moving on from that the solutions in actually getting that next generation and even current generation uh, digital uh, cabling into uh, well both down streets and then into properties and you know, moving forward to the next stage of um, you know, decent connectivity provision. Um, the government has provided a, a new digital infrastructure fund which we're supporting London local authorities to bid into um, and uh, you know, obviously also working with those local <coughs> authorities to provide uh, direct support and advice to individual businesses who are facing problems <coughs> while also engaging directly at the mayoral level with the um, digital infrastructure providers, especially through the Chief Digital Officer. So yes, absolutely, it's a, it's a challenge we're very much aware of and something that we're very keen to address. Uh, it, it's worth also mentioning that we're doing some work with um, Transport for London in particular to explore uh, how we can make the most of the um, underground assets that we have to spread connectivity through London and across the Tube network. So staying with this then, um, how does the EDS support small businesses um, in, with that sort of problem. Are you saying that the connectivity team is an intervention team uh, and that the chief digital officer will be able to, um, what, contract the work? Do something? It's the doing, isn't it? Indeed, and that's why we have to work very closely with local authorities. Because <coughs> naturally, I mean, look, we're not going to pretend that the connected connectivity team here at City Hall or the Chief Digital Officer can provide direct support or solutions to individual businesses or even uh, small <coughs> clusters of businesses on a direct level, but we can work closer with local authorities to support them in that work and also do our best to draw down on central government funding to channel more of it into London's not spots and problem areas. If you okay. provide us with the contact details, we can respond mm -hmm. to your contact directly and let them know what exactly it is we're doing in practice on the ground, working with Hackney <coughs> or whichever Hack Council that business is based within. The, the awfulness of replying to something like that, if it's taken them two years and all you're going to be talking about is um, talking uh, with, then that really just fills them with more despair. No, we can tell them in practice what we are doing, what funds will be available to address the gaps, how we're working directly with the providers and so on. Jane, yeah, it was, was relevant because I believe that is something that a lot of small businesses have on their table now. Uh, especially in some parts of London, um, where it's deemed that um, uh, it's not a market failure, so therefore um, government can't intervene. But it is affecting businesses <coughs> Absolutely, yeah. who employ yeah. local people, local women, local young lads. And if they can't get that employment, they can't get that foot on the first rung of a local company they haven't got a hope in hell of getting to the city. We see it as a utility, like water and energy. And that's reflected in the London plan as well, in the draft London plan. Just a little bit more urgency. Okay, town centres and high street businesses. Um, how, how does um, an economic strategy best support non-high growth businesses. Uh, I suppose we're thinking there in terms of um, independent high street retail, cafe shops. And it, um, how do you know about how resilient they are? Because if they, if they close, and then nothing, to, nothing, I've got nothing against charity shops, but then you get them, the landlord quite clearly saying to a charity, use it. Um, I mean, do you have a sense that there is an issue there? And how are you going to <coughs> deal with that? Who are you going to work with to give um, non-high growth businesses that resilience? Because they employ people, they're important to communities. 
They're very, very important. High streets are uh, a hugely important part of our, uh, sort of almost part of our sort of DNA uh, in London. Um, their importance is in a lot of different ways because they are pretty, most of the high streets are very close to the transport links. Most of the small businesses are based either on high streets or just near within uh, uh, walking distance from high streets. So hugely important for small businesses, hugely important for uh, the local communities as well. Um, of course, with the change in the economy, with the digital and so on, uh, it has created challenges uh, for high street uh, as more and more people are uh, sort of shopping online and so the more innovative businesses have come about and sort of the way people consume uh, uh, and order things, uh, those behaviour have changed. So Rajesh, tell me about where in this document is the intervention? What's, what's the doing? How are you going to help them? Well, so there are a lot of sort of policy things that we are doing, of course, in this uh, particular document, which is a more higher level uh, document, but we'll be sort of working with uh, boroughs to make sure that the high streets um, are uh, receiving the uh, particular attention it has. In fact, there was a, uh, uh, there was a document published, uh, High Streets for All, um, which was written by, we made that, and LSE Cities, which was funded by uh, LEAP. Um, further explores the economic, social and environmental value of high streets and sets out the strategic case for advocacy, in intervention and investment in London high streets. So the outcomes of this report will shape our future investments in high street and small businesses, uh, including through the Good Growth Fund, a £70 million regeneration programme uh, to support growth and community development uh, in London. Um, so that's particularly for uh, high street. I mean, this is quite uh, substantial. So it's about <coughs> 70 million pound um, uh, regeneration program, but also supporting. This is also part of the um, wider support that we provide around uh, SMEs through the London uh, uh, Growth Hub, uh, which is uh, or you know helping sort of high street shops and small businesses. Is that targeted in any way? Sorry? Do you target outer London? Do you target yes, so middle it's London? Yes, across Borough, we try and sort of spread it obviously uh, throughout, uh, but it is targeted and uh, there are a lot of them are sort of in specific um, uh, areas, um, the specific boroughs, and we work with <coughs> local boroughs on that. We organize road shows around that, we organize master classes. Um, so, yes, it is. And then for many years, under the previous mayor, there was a high street um, support fund. And the evaluation of that was very good. But you guys haven't picked that up. Why is that? So uh, That's the evolved into the Good Growth Fund. <coughs> that's evolved now, and that's yeah. now. So they're, it's they're, the Good Growth Fund, which right. has increased in size and remains. Right. And right. it certainly would fund exactly the same sort of projects as the old high street funds used to support. Um, it's just a more holistic way of looking at the kind of interventions, interventions we can make okay. into local regeneration, job creation and so forth. Okay. And just remind me, when is that starting? Or is um, it started? It, it started already. When was it? It was started? launched last year. I can send you the link. Um, it's, so it's, it's launched last year, so we can send you questions about how effective that has been. You can give us answers. Yes, and just to respond to your earlier question as to where exactly in the EDS these policies are, they're actually cross-cutting across all three chapters, um, from creating better places to ensuring there's the right infrastructure there, such as Wi-Fi availability, having the you know, good quality, high quality public realm, um, such as the Transport for London's Health Streets Initiative, um, <coughs> to the policies that Rajesh has just outlined around supporting small <coughs> independent businesses across all sectors. So it's, it's quite a cross-cutting approach. Okay, thank you. Um, Andrew, um, You've heard what the officers have said, um, and in terms of any work that you've done about these conditions for growth outside of um, the central zone, outside the central zone, um, would you like to hear more? Have you got any ideas to give to these guys? Not really. I make a couple of observations. So, if you think about the the, the London economy over the last fifteen years, essentially. 
what we've seen, and this is not only evident in London, it's evident in our other big cities in the UK and other big cities uh, around uh, the globe, particularly Europe and the US, uh, what we've seen is a centralisation of high-skilled, high-knowledge jobs. So it's, as a relative share, there are more of those types of jobs in central London today than there were 10 years ago. Mm. And I'm fairly confident in saying there'll be more of those in, a, in 10 years' time for a whole bunch of reasons that we, we fully understand and we, you know, we appreciate. Even though it's the most expensive place to do business yet, there is a certain, <coughs> type, of thing, uh, a certain type of worker that is in central uh, London. You don't see those sorts of businesses and those sorts of workers in the same abundance outside of central London <coughs> for obvious reasons. Right? The benefits that they accrue are not quite the same sort of thing. So I just make an observation about the nature of economic geography as it plays out in a city like London, as it increasingly plays out in Leeds and Manchester or New York or Berlin or wherever else. There's a concentration at the high end and then essentially non-traded as I would call it, local services are fairly evenly distributed across space. And you see that in London, in a sense, you know, non-traded stuff, retail, customer services, all of that sort of stuff is predominantly serving local populations. And you know, you've got big issues then about consumer demand. So when I think about out of London, I think about it in that way, firstly, and I then begin to think about maybe some of the responses are more than retail, in a sense. What we see in other places is reimagining high streets, not as places where people go to shop, in the classic form where you know they have 10 pounds in their pocket and they go on a saturday and they go and spend it because actually you know a whole bunch of things change what you see some places and, you know these are big places and smaller places where it's their city center itself which is in decline which obviously that isn't the case in london is thinking about more than retail on the one hand more than commercial on the other hand you know i think we do have to be more flexible and i am looked in detail at the london plan so forgive me if it says all of this sort of stuff but thinking about population and growth and people in those town centres, can we easily move uses that were predominantly employment or retail into, into residential to bring people into high streets? I've no idea. There are other factors and other issues that are more than retail. My worry would be, firstly, London gets itself into a position where it thinks it can distribute high-skilled work wherever it wants to. No evidence of that, by the way, anywhere in the world. And secondly, still is wedded to this kind of retail-focused, classic high street. If we just make this environment a bit better place to shop, that that will somehow bring these high streets back. I'm sceptical on both of those sorts of fronts. So, so the, the risk is um, continuing with the same... Um, over, what, the next 10, 20 years? No, because I think there are different models going on in London, which is partly driven by policy and partly not, right? Mm -hmm. You know, think about what's happening. You, you know, policymakers talk about tech city. That existed before policymakers even Absolutely. knew it existed, right? That's a market-led mm -hmm. process that politicians are piled on the property. back of. Right? It was cheap property. King's, King's Cross is another interesting example. A new neighbourhood been generated because of this centralisation of mm. London, mm. this growth of the CBD, mm. it now takes in places like King's Cross mm. or Southwark, mm. right, or places over in Paddington. They weren't part of the CBD mm. 15 years ago, they will. What mm. we observe in King's Cross is that is beginning to affect Finsbury Park, mm -hmm. right? You see that can happen. Now, policy is helping to a degree, but it's mainly following, it's not leading in any way. And then you've got stuff like Stratford City, mm -hmm. big investment, you know, opening up the new areas of London, significant public sector investment in terms of jobs going into there, in terms of some of the central government institutions, etc., going in, TfL going over there as well. And then you've got things like Croydon. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of, you know, Croydon City Centre struggled for many, many years, hemorrhaged a lot of private sector jobs, mm -hmm. stabilised at a lower scale, got some physical environment problems, but slowly places like that are beginning to think <coughs> about themselves in a slightly different context, good places to work, easy access into central London, actually easy access out into Gatwick as well, which is very important. So, you know, trying to understand how these things are emerging, very difficult for politicians because it's messy. It doesn't all happen in the way that we'd ideally want them. But these sort of, you know, just thinking about that in a bit more of a nuanced way, I think, gives us a better handle on what we do or don't do in relation to outer London. Long answer, apologies. Yeah, Maria. Um, so if, if you want to support SMEs and certain types of sort of, you know, in quotes, high street kind of shops, 
That's fine, but don't do it for economic growth. There's no empirical evidence whatsoever that I know of that shows that SMEs in and of themselves, so firm size matters. There's some evidence about age and this whole, and you did mention the word, um, you know, these kind of high growth young companies, sometimes we call them gazelles. There is evidence that they are key to certain types of growth, especially innovation led growth. But so that would require a different type of um, defense or reason why one would want to support say retail shops. And I think that's where then there's an opportunity to rethink this, right? So, you know, demand side, you mentioned customers now. So demand side policies have always been important <coughs> since the beginning of capitalism for actually allowing, for example, new types of technologies to diffuse and get fully deployed throughout the economy. So mass production was a big revolution 100 years ago and without suburbanization, mass production would not have actually had the effect as a technological change um, in terms of productivity and sort of growth across the economy. So one of the questions I think that, that regions have today is what is the equivalent of suburbanization as a demand side policy, because people didn't just wake up and go to the suburbs, it actually did come out of policy, um, for allowing kind of digital and the whole kind of IT revolution to really have an effect on say, growth and inclusive growth, you know, what do we mean by inclusive growth, how can the digital agenda also help sort of steer uh, inclusive growth, and that requires, again, a very different <coughs> type of policy than the ones we've been talking about so far, and, you know, that, it, that should not be reduced to, you know, we want to help the high street, it's what kind of high street, you know, do you want, for example, particular kinds of high streets, shops that actually fit within your, I can't remember the name, not the good standard business model, what was it called? Good growth. Good, no, no, no. The good, good, work standard. good work standard. Most retail shops are terrible with their workers. You know, most abuse and exploitative relationships actually happen in certain types of retail shops. So that itself could become a way that you steer the kind of retail. You know, London should be proud of having a retail industry that perhaps doesn't sell T-shirts made by I don't know child labor, or that actually does pay the living wage, or that also fits in with the sustainable growth and clean growth strategy of London. I don't know. I mean, that's up to London to decide, but it has to go beyond the static concept of SMEs or the high street, which is again just a static picture and often SMEs are just as much a part of the problem as say the financial sector because we need to talk about the quality, not the quantity. Okay, so seven million being spent um, in this regeneration program asking the same, based on the same criteria of recreating or keeping the high street as it is, mm. in your world, that's not a good, um, that's not good. Uh, well, I doubt it's true. <coughs> I don't think you said you want to spend that amount of money to keep things as they are. I'm sure that it has to do with the transformational growth. Well, you don't know, because you haven't seen no, it. No, no, I don't know. I'm saying, I'm sure, meaning I hope. <laughs> You don't know. I mean, yes. and uh, we'd have to go back because I'm sure, I'm sure the guys are going to say, "Oh yeah, we've got all that in," but we would have to see that for ourselves. Yeah, it should be part of the transformational growth strategy. It, it should it be, be. and uh, maybe we'll get back to. We'll have a look at that if we if we choose to look at that and, and ask some questions specifically um, about that. But if you like, just let me just move on a little bit. And uh, based on all that you've said, um, uh, Mariana. Um, <coughs> I'm getting from you that if the mayor doesn't get buy-in from the private sector to develop their own staff um, and um, be looking to a much more flexible, well-paid labour force, <coughs> that we are not going to, if you like, keep this world-class status that we have. Well, I think business does respond to leadership, but also to certainty around what the rewards are right. in terms of actually, um, you know, fitting in or slash obeying some sort of, no, I don't like the word obeying, anyway, um, adapting to a, a particular type of growth strategy. So we know, for example, that if you, in, in the green area, if you just, you know, pr present a, sort of a feed-in tariff policy and then take it away with sort of no narrative and no stability around that, that creates problems, but the same thing would apply to any sort of directional growth. So you want sort of a clear mission, a clear statement, but also rewards for actually taking part and engaging with 
the good growth strategy. It's, it's not enough just to talk about it. I would also say that organizations really matter. So you talked about digital before. One of the most revolutionary things that happened in the UK around digital was when GDS, Government Digital Services, was run by three incredibly inspirational uh, people, including Mike Bracken and Tom Lusmore and Ben Terrett, where they actually said, you know, digital in and of itself is not the issue. We have to have an idea about the citizen as a user, not a customer or a client, right? And especially with all this outsourcing of public services, but this notion that citizens are clients or, or customers, whether it's about education or health, has actually been quite toxic for the kinds of services that then they use. So GDS had a huge impact in terms of even getting this massive international design award, but also becoming a really cool place to work and also achieving huge gains, savings for the government without ever thinking about efficiency. They achieved something like four billion in efficiency, but actually focusing on the public value that they were generating. And their mantra was citizens or users. Always think about the user experience. And this would come back to that email you received from your um, constituent, which is perhaps what also we need to think about is not just, okay, get him or her to call up and they'll fix it in a patchy way, but is part of the problem, the way that value is being generated and being guided by, because I think the last set of questions are also around metrics, particularly problematic ways that we measure, capture, and justify public value. And you mentioned before something about correcting market failures. Mm -hmm. That itself sometimes becomes a patchy uh, approach. So it really should be about co-creating and co-shaping markets, not just putting patches when a market messes up, and as we know, markets do mess up all the time, and they do require patchy policies, but that's not going to get you good <coughs> growth. Good growth will come from a framework which is much more about co-creating, co-shaping markets. This institute I've set up at UCL sort of has that as its mantra, and we're trying to do that, also working with the Treasury. What would that mean for the Green Book? Um, but anyway, I, I, I do it's think, actually, quick. that Just the strategy, how it's written, could well done well this kind of approach, approach, and maybe, again, in the next yeah. round, thinking more about the frameworks that then create value cross-cuttingly across different areas requires a different type of policy approach. Yeah. Deputy, a quick one to you. Um, uh, given what you've heard, um, are you working with um, government departments um, in terms of bringing in sort of the policy developments that governments may well be thinking about um, uh, implementing and um, is there, uh, is, isn't there a need for the mayor through yourself to be working with government departments and the big representatives of business in order for us to see business as part and parcel of what's going to happen in London? We are working at a lot of different levels. So, for example, around Brexit, uh, we are working with business leaders. So Mayor, Mayor created a Brexit Experts Advisory Group, uh, which is uh, business leaders from <coughs> different sectors. And the Mayor regularly meets David Davis, uh, who is the Secretary of State for Brexit, um, to make sure that London business voice is heard um, in uh, Brexit negotiations. But apart from that, we are constantly engaging with businesses. We've also got the uh, Mayor's Business Advisory Board, uh, which is again through a lot of different sectors, um, uh, sort of meeting regularly. In fact, we had a uh, meeting uh, last week. But also working with uh, various uh, sort of government departments and making them, them aware of the challenges that London businesses face and things that London need, whether it's to do with transport and infrastructure, uh, or whether it's around skills and access to single market uh, uh, and all different levels. So we, we try and be very, um, if you like, whilst we can be sort of critical, but we try and be as constructive uh, as possible. And that's why we sort of published the study we published around uh, uh, Brexit and the impact, various scenario planning to help the government in a way as they go in the negotiations. So knowing that what it would mean for London, various scenarios, uh, around our negotiations. Thanks. Thank you, Jeanette. I, mean, I, I just pick up on that very, very, very quickly. <coughs> yes, right. I think it's an important, time. It's an important point to make, which is you know, compared to uh, his and the institution's international counterparts, you know, 
the mayor and the GLA is essentially operating with at least one arm behind its back. Mm. Right? Mm. You know, all the things that we've talked about. Mm. You know, take PDR, right? Permitted development rights. Mm. It's a national intervention, mm. national policy, mm. designed for somewhere. Mm. I don't know where, but no. he's actually told me that. <laughs> but the point is, it's certainly not appropriate and applicable for London. For London. No. But we, you know, we have to deal with it. That's the same in Manchester, it's the same in mm. Leeds. That's not the same in other international no. cities where they have much more, more control. Mm. Business rates is a good example, where mm. essentially that's a national programme mm. that we have to grapple with at the edges in London or in Manchester or in Leeds. That isn't the same mm. other places. So when we think about creating the conditions for growth, mm. part of the challenge is resolving and dealing with the tensions that are given to us by national government. Like, never mind about consumers and the market. Part of what we're trying to grapple with is the problems that national policy <laughs> presents for London, vis-a-vis -vis Burnley, vis-a-vis, -vis, right? I mean, that's a bigger issue, it's a bigger question, but we can't, for, you know, we should never forget the toolbox for the mayor in London limited. is relatively limited compared to his counterparts in other countries. No, we, we live with that through our day work. I know you do. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move us on um, and bring Sean in, but <coughs> mainly in. Um, and we're now going to be looking at how we're going to measure what the mayor is doing. So I'm, I'm going to ask a couple of questions around metrics, really. We had quite a broad discussion, and I think what underpins that discussion is metrics. For me, it's been a running theme through many of the mayor's um, um, strategies. There are no KPIs. We, are, we don't have anything. This plan runs to 2041, which I have some sympathy with, because you're talking about a large city. You have to have a deep view. But can you give me some indications, I'm talking to Deputy Mayor here, yeah. around what we will be measuring? How will we know if this has worked or not? Just, just a few examples of the metrics that the mayor will use to measure success or not. So the, obviously the final economic development strategy will set out the key success uh, measures of the strategy. Um, and you know, that's why this, your feedback uh, on this would be very useful as we sort of uh, uh, work on that. But traditionally economic performance is measured in terms of changes in the value of economic output, income and expenditure uh, produced in economy alongside changes in the other <coughs> key economic <coughs> indicators, such as employment, productivity, savings, investment prices, and inflation, etc. However, we believe that a broader range of indicators are needed uh, to assess social and economic welfare, taking account of how the proceeds um, of the growth are distributed um, and how different groups are benefited from it, as well as the indicators looking at the sustainability uh, of growth. As the policies in this strategy uh, are developed, a wider range of indicators will be considered um, and monitored. This would include indicators demonstrating outcomes such as a fairer and uh, more inclusive economy, a city that is open for business, and sustainable growth and development across capital. A set of precise indicators to measure progress will be included in the final strategy. Uh, some of these will measure success in areas uh, with specific mayoral or GLA intervention, <coughs> while others will monitor the health of uh, London's economy more generally. Some examples, um, a fair, for, for a fair and inclusive economy, we'll sort of look at gender, ethnicity, uh, disability pay gaps, employees uh, earning below the London living wage, unemployment, long-term uh, long unemployment rates, um, uh, educational uh, attainments, households in temporary accommodation, homelessness, um, healthy life expectancy by place and social economic uh, group, um, children living in poverty, housing and transport costs as a percentage of income, percentage of uh, Londoners volunteering, crime rates, those sort of things. But in terms of creating the conditions of growth, we'll be looking at businesses, uh, business startup and survival rates, inward investment, import-export, growth in GVA per job, supply of office capacity, availability of industrial land, <coughs> provision of affordable workspace, broadband and mobile speed coverage, um, uh, investment in transport infrastructure, crowding on rail, tube and DLR services and train delays, people choosing to walk or cycle, carbon emissions, access to green space, 
percentage of waste recycled, uh, housing uh, completions, uh, higher education uh, rankings, and in terms of uh, supporting London sectors, uh, things like we we'll be looking at things like international smart city rankings, R and D expenditure, GVA by sector, uh, angel <coughs> like VC investment by sector, innovation uh, survey result. For example, introduction of uh, new products and services. So there is a very wide range uh, of measures. So rather than just sort of, so it's more detailed and dissected as opposed to being uh, <coughs> sort of headline. I've heard what you said. Almost none of that is. Well, let me put it another way. A great, great deal of what you've said is outside of what this plan is about. You know, and so you either leave the mayor as a hostage to fortune or <coughs> how effective other plans are, or you cram stuff in here that this plan has no um, way of addressing and neither should it have any way of addressing. So that's why I, I, I say that. I open it up to the rest of the panel with the words, could you give this team some advice on metrics that they could look at that would be relevant to this, to this mayor's current term? The, the, again, I want to make the point, for me, many of the mayor's plans have had no metrics in them at all. They've had no measurement, no KPI, no what could we look at to improve, nothing to, no, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, no specifics, no, no baseline that we're measuring against. And I want to see uh, some evidence of the baselines we're measuring against and where we expect <coughs> to be in relation to a timeline, two years, four years, ten years, whatever. That's what I'm interested in. Please, Catherine, go ahead. Just as a point of clarification, um, the, the, the indicators that Jash has just listed off are simply example indicators of how one could measure progress under those three core work streams of the EDS. What we will be putting together is a baseline um, and that will be comprised of a mixture of KPIs and programmes that we are delivering where we can categorically say the mayor has had an impact on X. But we will also, in addition to that, be measuring indicators that can show the longer term how we can track the health of the overall economy. Um, and economic fairness is the area where we are most advanced in terms of our thinking and the development of our indicators and um, I'm sure the Chair can circulate a copy of progress so far for your input. On the other two areas that Rajesh um, spoke about, supporting London sectors and creating the conditions for growth, we are just commencing that work stream now, so input from members would be extremely <coughs> helpful and others. Thank uh, you. I accept that you, this is draft and you're building, but I, I, I have um, his, my history on my side about the lack, lack, sure. lack, of, lack of KPIs and we want a focus set that around what this can deliver, what this mayor will change and how his policies are acting. I do, I accept your point, the mayor does have the right to sort of congregate his effects of all the other policies because these things are linked, I get it, you know, all our, our policy areas overlap. But that very long list bared very little resemblance to the actions that this report talks about. But just, just moving on, um, Marina. Um, uh, so Marina, sorry, excuse me. Um, I'm just copying. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I do like your concept of problems rather than sectors, but can you give us just one example or, or a concept of how we would measure progress of that? So, let me just give you a very kind of crazy example <coughs> in less than a minute, back to your question. Going to the moon was very concrete, right? They knew when they got there. Had they just talked about the space race, which was the challenge that was driving later the going to the moon, they would have not gone to the moon. The equivalent is happening today with the challenges that we hear about, whether it's inequality, you know, smart innovation-led growth, aging, uh, the clean growth strategy. These are just challenges, <coughs> transforming them to problems that you can actually say, we got there or we didn't, is the issue. Now, you don't want an economist telling you what the problem exactly should be around aging. You want the experts and nurses and other people who actually have expertise in the area to be in the room with the mayor's uh, team to say, okay, to actually really tackle the aging demographic issue, et cetera, this, is, this could be an interesting uh, 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 mission to pose, right? But what you currently have is a welcome to this approach because Greg Clark, the minister for base, who's actually come out with, they've come out with an industrial strategy, the white paper, actually sets very clearly these four challenges, which are about clean growth, aging, uh, the digital 
society slash artificial intelligence and mobility. And London could be, in the UK, the place where these challenges actually become real, right? So whether it's the mobility challenge, you know, I don't know. I mean, surely you are currently talking. I think Sadiq also has his design counselors now. One of our professors is one of the counselors there, Dan Hill. You know, getting those people in the room to say, you know, how do you actually apply strategic design to the mobility problem and what would this, you know, how could we foster cross-sectoral investment and what would be the metric to say we got there, like when they got to the moon. I think those are the conversations that should be had. But even something like zero rise in homelessness. I mean, again, I've lived here 20 years and it's been exponential, the increase in homelessness just in the last five to 10 years. You know, zero increase in homelessness is actually a target where you could say, we got there, we didn't, and it would require investments across all sorts of different sectors, but also actors, right? Third sector, private and public. Um, you know, 100% recycling is, is actually something that some cities have set themselves, and that actually requires all sorts of uh, innovations beyond recycling. But again, you don't, I mean, my simple point as an economist to say that the kind of stimulus to the city in terms of growth that you provide when you say a mission-oriented problem which has a target where you can say yes or no, we did or did not achieve it, I think would be really useful for you because it would help you get okay, away from Okay, let me pose a question yeah. to, the, to Deputy Mayor then. What is the Mayor's appetite for giving us solid targets around this strategy? Again, it sounds very nice. Um, nobody could argue with, with the general push of direction, but I'm very concerned about the lack of hook to say if we deliver. What is the Mayor's appetite for giving us solid Target, you know, zero rise in this, 100% change in that, 20% change in that. Anybody from the mayor's team, what's, what's the mayor's appetite for that? Well, first of all, I'm very glad to hear that you agree with uh, most of the things. No, in I the, didn't say uh, that. I, said, I, agree <laughs> I agree with the tone. I agree with the tone. Credit where credit is due. With the tone, you agree with the tone, yeah, which is very good. Due. I think that's a uh, very good start. Look, this is why the measuring is very important. I think, you know, you, if, if you want to do well, you've got to, you know, where measure what you're doing and what you have achieved. And that's why, you know, we are sort of the way we are looking to measure all the list, all the things that I've uh, mentioned to you uh, earlier, is um, is a lot more detailed than what sort of historically uh, the growth has been measured. So the way we are measuring, we are sort of, in a way, measuring ourselves in in sort of a lot more uh, detail. And but I also disagree with uh, the point that you are saying that uh, none of the things that I've actually listed. Uh, are sort of measuring um, what's in the document. The fact is that what, what we've discussed in the last couple of hours, I mean, a lot of the things that um, we've discussed are some of the examples that I've mentioned here, that whether it's about sort of pay gaps, whether it's about living wage, whether it's about looking at the um, unemployment rates, whether uh, we've talked about uh, accommodation and homelessness, uh, we've talked about <coughs> housing and transport costs, as a percentage of income, for example, we've talked okay, about... Okay, I, I accept, I accept. I, I did try to soften my line by saying the mayor has the right to claim the strategies because they do overlap. If you fix some infrastructure problem, that aids employment, and I get that. And this is sits at the bottom, is trying to talk about money. I accept that. But there's a very long list, and the thing about a KPI is the concept behind it. Why are we using that one, whatever. But, but I, I digress because we're running out of time, and I can feel the chair sending over the, the Jedi mind trick. Um, I just, I just want to um, ask Andrew, a, this is a very specific or slightly tangential question. One of my, um, one of the people I do with London, a, a young man, he said these words to me, and I want to see how we're going to measure this. This is why I said it. He said, automation is not a threat to London, but it is a threat to Londoners. <coughs> the example he gave was, when was the last time you used a travel agent? There's an app for that. And, he, and his belief is that um, we, when we talk about skills, London has an hour shape, hourglass shape economy. You're at the top and you develop these whizzy, you know, apps, you send rockets to the moon and you do very, very well out of it. You're at the bottom where there's lots of work, not well paid work, but there's lots of it. It's people in the middle who are not going anywhere. How are we measuring that change? Because no matter what happens in London, that technology is coming. Driverless cars, new apps, fintech, trading. How are we preparing Londoners to deal with that? I go back to my point earlier on about the middle, the, 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 the people who are born and bred in London, parents came here, they're not at the very top. What in the economic development strategy is going to help them find sustainable 
long-term employment to feed themselves and their family. That is what I don't sense here. That is what I'd like to see more of. I accept that some of the issues around that sit in other strategies, but I also <coughs> want to see the bridge. This whole thing of, of mission base, I'm beginning to warm to. Can I see this link with other, demonstrate to me how this links to something else. I'm not saying it doesn't, but just demonstrate how this links to the housing strategy, for instance. And I say the housing strategy because I couldn't find a target for housing and you couldn't provide me with one. Sure, can, can you wrap that into a, quest, into a final question or was it a statement? It, 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 was, it was a question <laughs> aimed at Andrew. What are we going to do about this change in, how are we going to measure yeah. the change in employment in London, where That's the jobs are? That's a very good point. And it raises, the, let me make two quick observations. One. We, we often get obsessed with the aggregate numbers, right? So what's the wage level in London, right? At the London level, how has that changed? We know that pretty well. What we need to do is to do much more finer grain distributional analysis, right? To look at how wages across different income decils have changed or not changed. That allows us to understand how distribution plays out across London rather than the aggregate. So KPIs need to be thinking about distribution, we can go into the more detail of that in, in a bit more detail. My, my other observation would be, when we get now beyond strategy and thinking about what you were saying, we need to be much sharper and clearer around how we are going to measure the impact of projects and interventions. Right. right? And we are, you know, this is not a criticism of London, it's a criticism per se. We are not very good at that. And at the very least, we need before and after with some control for the intervention. And I can tell you, on average, about 6% of the average of the evaluations that are done at any one time would adhere to those three basic requirements and everything else is a waste of time. Right? Because it doesn't control, it doesn't tell you what was happening before, what happened after, and it didn't control for the intervention. So just observing change in itself tells us very, very little. What we want to know is what was the project intervention? I'll give you an example. We are now working with some uh, London boroughs to really understand what makes a difference in terms of intervention with people with mild mental health problems in getting them back into the labour market. We don't know, right, firstly. So the there's no evidence there. But we've designed the programme in a way that allows us to look at different types of interventions with a similar cohort to understand what was before, what was after and to control for the nature of the intervention. We will know in time what really makes a difference to people with mild mental health, can we work <coughs> and get them into the labour market and keeping them in the labour market. Mm. Now, it's that kind of finer grained analysis that maybe not for the strategy, but when we get to intervention level, that's what I would love to see London saying, we're going to be the world class leader in that space. We're going to give, we're going to commit ourselves to the evidence review and the evidence use over and above any other city across the globe. That space is open for, you know, for take-up. Okay, thank you. I'm going to return to the chair because the, the pressure is, is huge. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm astonished at that Jedi mind trick that I was supposed to have done. I'm, I'm wondering where <laughs> Earth that came from. Anyway, um, I, I want to thank all of you. Um, it has been an incredibly interesting conversation, and I hope that Rajesh and your team um, have actually got some useful stuff to take away from that. Sort of, you know, particularly thinking about you know what kind of wealth creation do we want for London, and uh, and also how it, you kind of work from addressing challenges to then addressing specific problems and the relationship between the challenges and the problems and hopefully that will help with the working out of what it is you're actually measuring um, in the final in the final strategy so um, but thank you to all our guests um, all your input has been incredibly useful valuable and helpful um, finally I just have a few little bits of uh, stuff we have to run through very quickly. I need to ask the committee to note the report and the discussion with our invited guests. Thank you. And delegate authority to me as chair in consultation with the party group lead members to agree any output from this discussion. Thank you. And can I ask the committee to note the response from the mayor to the committee's report, The Fate of Local News, read all about it. Thank you. And can I ask the committee to note its report, <coughs> Short Change, The Financial Health of Londoners. <coughs> Excellent. And can I ask the committee to note the work programme and priorities for the remainder of the Assembly year 2017-18 to 18, 
as set out in paragraphs 4.2 to 4.7 of the report. And can I also ask the committee to delegate authority to me as chair in consultation with party group lead members to agree arrangements for any informal meeting or engagement activities which may help in our scrutiny of the Mayor's draft, transport, uh, draft, sorry, draft strategy and as part of the evidence gathering process to inform the committee responses to the Mayor's draft economic development strategy and draft culture strategy. Great. Thank you. And please can the committee note the next meeting is scheduled for the 20th of February 2018 at 10 a.m. in committee room five here in City Hall. And there is no urgent business, so that concludes our meeting. Thank you. GLA, committee room five, sound.